Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, World Habitat Day celebrations in New York, um, post-pandemic cities. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you, distinguished guests, honorable uh, permanent representatives. Um, I am uh, encouraged by the uh, opportunity to host this event together with uh, the uh, uh, American Institute of Architects, uh, New York chapter and national, as well as the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization and uh, my colleagues in the United Nations system. Uh, today, we will have uh, a, an event that takes place in uh, several segments. The first segment or opening segment uh, will be with um, a number of representatives from the United Nations system and permanent missions to the United Nations here in New York. Um, I would like to welcome uh, uh, the following speakers. Um, we will first hear from the, uh, a message from the Secretary General, uh, as well as an address from our Executive Director, Maimouna Sharif. This will be followed by a, uh, remarks from the permanent representative of the Republic, Michael Milnar, um, at, followed by um, a presentation from uh, Susan uh, Mwangi, uh, Charge d'Affaires, uh, the per and acting permanent representative of, of the Kenya mission, uh, and Amal Mudavalali, uh, the permanent representative of Lebanon to the UN here in New York. These um, presentations will be followed by uh, uh, representatives from the American Institute of Architects, in particular, Jane Frederick, uh, the president of the American Institute of Architects at the national level, and Kim Yao, the American Institute of Architects in New York chapter. Uh, the session will be concluded uh, by an intervention by Lance Brown, president of the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization. Um, I look forward to uh, moderating this opening session. And um, just a slight correction uh, based on my notes, uh, Naomi and Tina, if you could please correct. The first speaker after the executive director would be uh, Honorable Susan Mwangi, followed by Amal Mudalali, followed by Michael Milnar. Is that correct? Over. We will assume so. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. We will assume so. Uh, with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, can I uh, request uh, the introduction of the Secretary General's remarks by video message. Thank you. Each year, World Habitat Day focuses attention on the state of the world's towns and cities. This year's observance highlights the centrality of housing as a driver for sustainable urban development. Currently, one billion people live in overcrowded settlements with inadequate housing. By 2030, that number will rise to 1.6 billion. Action is needed now to provide low-income families and vulnerable <coughs> populations with affordable housing, with security of tenure, and easy access to water, sanitation, transport, and other basic services. To meet global demand, more than 96,000 housing units will need to be completed every day, and they must be part of the green transition. The urgency of improving living conditions has been brought to, for to the fore by COVID-19, which has devastated the lives of millions in cities. Access to clean water and sanitation, along with social distancing, are key responses to the pandemic. Yet, in slums, it has proved difficult to implement these measures. This means an increased risk of infection, not only within slums, but in all cities, many of which are largely serviced by low-income, informal sector workers living in informal settlements. On World Habitat Day, in this crucial decade of action to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, I call for heightened efforts to promote the partnerships, pro-poor policies and regulations needed to improve housing in cities. As we strive to overcome the pandemic, address the fragilities and inequalities it has exposed and combat climate change, now is the time to harness the transformative potential of urbanization for the benefit of people and planet. Each year, thank you very much. Uh, have we finished the video? Um, I just saw it was a bit cut off. Is that finished? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Tina. Um, I now have the uh, honor to welcome the Executive Director and Under Secretary of the UN Habitat, Maimouna Sharif, uh, who has had a whirlwind. Uh, World Habitat Day, celebrating over the course of 24 hours, and we are uh, thankfully um, happy to have her with us here to close uh, 
per day in World Habitat Day. Um, uh, Honorable Executive Director, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Honorable Permanent Representative to the United Nations in New York, professional architects and planners, distinguished academics and futurists, participating colleagues throughout the United Nations systems, participants from around the world joining us online, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. It gave me a great pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 World Habitat Day celebration in New York under the theme of Housing for All, A Better Urban Future. Today, we take an opportunity to reflect on the state of towns and cities and on the basic right for all to adequate shelter. We are also reminded that we all have the power and the responsibility to shape the future of our cities and towns. Later in today's program, you will see a glimpse of the Housing for All campaign, which calls for actions to improve housing conditions around the world. This year, we are celebrating World Habitat Day virtually around the world in over 50 locations. In these various events, we have celebrated World Habitat Day in different ways. However, a common element in all the sessions is COVID-19 and its implications for cities and urban development. This is certainly the case at the event here in New York entitled Post-Pandemic Cities. Since mid-March, we have all been gripped by the pandemic. At UN Habitat, we acted swiftly by repurposing USD 1.3 million to support COVID-19 responses in 13 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Through this initiative and additional funding from the United Nations system, we supported efforts by governments to adapt help responses to informal settlements and slums, and managed to support 2 million people through youth-led hand washing stations, among other initiatives. We are working with 64 countries around the world to implement UN Habitat's COVID-19 response plan, which is still ongoing. As a contributor to the wider United Nations system-wide system action, UN Habitat worked closely with World Health Organization on the health response and with OCHA and the Interagency Standing Committee on Humanitarian Response. We also led the work stream on social cohesion and resilient communities of the United Nations framework for immediate social and economic response to the pandemic. Importantly, UN Habitat led an interagency process to prepare the Secretary General's policy brief titled COVID-19 in an urban world. As we just heard from the Secretary General in his address, over 90% of COVID-19 cases occurred in urban areas and effort to live with pandemics will be tied to the future of cities. We, take, we have taken seriously this question of post-pandemic cities, not only in our immediate response, but also in our thinking. UN Habitat is currently preparing a report that will be launched later this year on the future state of cities in a world with pandemics. This will consider the implications of pandemics for cities. Specifically, it will examine the role of the state and local governments in equality, urban form, public health, and urban economy and finance. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no doubt that the pandemic has and will continue to challenge our assumptions about urban development. I am therefore grateful to the panelists of the World Habitat Day celebration in New York for their insight and advice moving forward. 
Thank you to the ambassadors of Lebanon, Slovak Republic, and Kenya, Amal, Mikhail, and Yambi. It is great to have you with us here today. Shukar dekeju asante. Thank you, leaders and of the American Institute of Architects and Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization, Jane, Kim, Langs, and Aliyev. Thanks for the organizing this event with the United Nations. Thank you, respective keynote speaker, Peter and Jeff. I look forward to learning from you today. And excellencies, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and other pan panelists and participants online, thanks for your active engagement in the World Habitat Day 2020. Thank you very much. Over to you, Chris. celebrated uh, around the world. Um, I now turn uh, uh, to Ambassador Michael Milnyar, the permanent representative of the Slovak Republic of the United Nations to, to New York. Ambassador, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning uh, to everybody. Sincere greetings. Uh, apologies for uh, joining the conversation uh, a little bit later due to other commitments uh, uh, that I had. Uh, um, it's uh, uh, a great uh, 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 honor and, and privilege uh, to be able to say a few words uh, uh, in this uh, important event and uh, happy uh, World uh, Habitat uh, Day to you all. Cities are at the center of uh, this pandemic. Uh, uh, that is probably an understatement uh, uh, as uh, uh, they have always been during many pandemics uh, in our history. Uh, we had or still have a chance to see how our city uh, we live in right now is uh, changing. Uh, New York, uh, uh, where we are as a center of culture and uh, home for more than 10 million people, has also been struck uh, heavily and has been changing uh, every day. Uh, from empty subway, uh, uh, vacant streets, closed restaurants, uh, to no traffic jams. Uh, of course, there might be uh, some uh, other uh, important challenges uh, involved. Uh, um, question uh, arises, will cities uh, uh, survive the coronavirus? Uh, uh, I think they will. Uh, in fact, uh, history shows that people often moved to cities after pandemics uh, because of uh, better job opportunities uh, and the higher wages they offered uh, after the sudden drop in uh, population. The, the crisis may provide a short window uh, for our unaffor unaffordable, hyper-gentrified cities to reset and uh, to re-energize uh, their creative uh, scenes. So I hope that uh, despite the challenges that, uh, that we are going through right now, uh, there, there will also be uh, opportunities uh, uh, that uh, uh, that can arise, or that we can turn the challenges into opportunities, maybe of uh, uh, different natures. The number of people living in urban areas has grown more than uh, fivefold since uh, the 1950s. Uh, today, half of the world's uh, population lives in cities, and this percentage will continue growing, as you know. Implications of uh, such urban mushrooming uh, have direct impact on the health and well-being of our people, our economies, and uh, and our planet. Uh, uh, the projected increase of 2.5 billion people moving to cities over next three decades uh, will be extraordinary challenge uh, that uh, we will uh, have to face. Cities already account for 70 percent of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and globally, approximately one third of the food uh, that is produced annually uh, is uh, is wasted. Uh, these are uh, just uh, additional challenges that uh, that we need to continue addressing uh, alongside uh, extensive traffic and waste production. Uh, just uh, uh, to add uh, to the uh, picture that uh, that we have in front of us, so the way in which we design and build our cities uh, uh, will be critical uh, in the near future 
and uh, it will even uh, be more critical after the uh, the pandemic uh, and this is uh, where the role of UN Habitat as, uh, as the principal UN agency uh, focused on um, uh, uh, urbanizations is uh, irreplaceable uh, uh, for sure. Uh, it has to be managed uh, in an inclusive uh, and uh, resource uh, efficient way. Inclusiveness and local action are really uh, key elements that I also would like to uh, uh, highlight as key enablers uh, that uh, need to be addressed. 95% uh, of urban expansion in the next decades is foreseen to take place in developing world. It is important to highlight uh, that youth has to be involved in these processes uh, in a meaningful and substantial way from the outset. From the outset, some aspects of our cities and metropolitan areas will be reshaped depending on how long the current uh, pandemic uh, lasts. Fear of density uh, and of subways or trains in particular, plus um, a desire for safer, more private surroundings may pull some towards the suburbs and rural areas. That's another challenge that we are already facing and that will probably be even further exacerbated. In conclusion, uh, let me uh, uh, also emphasize uh, that the pandemic is exposing the quality of governance and scale of inequalities uh, in our global cities. What we need to do at this point is to look uh, uh, what has been working and uh, what is potentially not working and take lessons from the field and uh, from our various uh, practical experiences. Uh, so uh, I believe this is a unique opportunity to build back better and I would like to very much invite you all to join forces uh, together with uh, UN Habitat and with uh, all the other important actors uh, to just uh, do that uh, thing uh, for the collective uh, uh, benefit of, uh, of us all. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, it's terrific to have you with us and uh, very much appreciate uh, your support and especially your insights. Um, helpful to uh, hear your views on how housing uh, and urban development moves forward with the pandemic and particularly the role of UN Habitat in supporting that. Thank you. Um, we now uh, move to um, Ambassador Susan Wangi, uh, the charge uh, d'affaires of, um, uh, of the permanent uh, mission of, the, of Kenya to the United, United Nations in New York, and she's the ad interim permanent representative. Susan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So, you have said, uh, Ms. Mahmoud and Sherry, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to join you and to represent Kenya in this virtual celebration of World Habitat Day. The key event of Urban October being celebrated worldwide in partnership with UN Habitat. I wish to congratulate UN Habitat for the successful organization urban October event, despite the global COVID pandemic. Discussion on post-pandemic cities is indeed clear and strategic. The centricity nature of COVID-19 demands rethinking and re-engineering around housing for all, a better urban future in current COVID-19 responses and post-COVID recovery. Undoubtedly, partnerships and multilateral cooperation which leverages on the United Nations system and on specialized UN programs in particular is fundamental. Distinguished guests, Kenya's response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been multi-pronged and has harnessed collaborative efforts and interventions that involve public and private sectors, civil society and UN programs and agencies. They include the formation of a government traffic, uh, of a government traffic COVID-19 response unit for seamless coordination and management across all government levels 47 sub-national government institutions, partners, and the private sector. Lockdown measures that include curfew and cessation of international travel, restriction of movement from COVID-19 hotspot areas, protocols on social distancing, wearing of masks, hand wash stations, ban on social gathering, closure of learning institutions and spacing in public transport vehicles. 
There's also state led interventions which include disbursement of a, of a billion Kenya shillings from the Universal Health Coverage Kitty towards the recruitment of additional health workers, PPEs, and training to support mitigation against COVID 19. The government is also providing tax incentives and reduction and lowered cash reserve ratio to increase liquidity ratio and loans to cushion businesses, especially SMEs, as well as direct cash transfers to persons in vulnerable situations. There's also an initiative dubbed Kazi Imtani, which is the concept conceptualization and implementation of the National Hygiene Program and utilizes labor intensive approaches to create sustainable public goods in the urban development sector. Residents from informal settlements, especially the youth, are recruited to undertake projects concentrated in and around informal settlements with the aim of improving the environment, service delivery, infrastructure, and providing income generation opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, response and recovery from COVID-19 demands building back better, including through sustainable urbanization, human settlements, and a resilient environment for nature and people. We must in partnership plan, design, fund, and implement to create conducive, healthy, resilient communities and cities where lives and livelihoods thrive. In May 2020, President Uhuru Kenyatta launched a $534 US million economic stimulus package in partnership with UN Habitat towards a COVID-19 response plan. This COVID-19 fund has enabled Kenya to access an extensive humanitarian resource base and contacts with humanitarian partners through interagency standing committees. In addition, the affordable housing agenda has also picked momentum and remains front and center to Kenya's post-COVID recovery. In the case of post-pandemic cities, there are lessons from the Nairobi Metropolitan Services, NMS, which has leveraged on COVID-19 pandemic to build back better through responsive and improved service delivery in, formal, in informal settlements, towns, and cities since March 2020. These NMS programs include SLAP, SLAM upgrading a road network for all nine, nine informal settlements in Nairobi, provision of portable water, protection of the environment through enforcement of into Nairobi rivers, and identification of green spaces in partnership with UN Habitat and the academia. Implementation of special planning zones and solid waste management, construction of water and sewage trunk, trunk systems ahead of the construction of affordable housing, rehabilitation of the Nairobi riverfront, upgrading and construction of 24 hospitals which are expected to be fully operational by December 2020, street lighting and construction of ablution blocks and parking spaces in 28 markets is ongoing. On urban mobility, public transport stations, public service, public stations are being built on the outskirts of the CBD and include commuter rail trains, which have been procured to facilitate efficient and affordable public transport in the county of Nairobi. The government is also mobilizing resources for possible piping of water for distribution in informal settlements. Excellences, distinguished guests. It is clear that building back better post-pandemic communities and cities will require visionary leadership, courage, partnerships, and determination to do things differently. Doing things differently informed the development of initiatives by the Kenya Turkey College Track on Infrastructure, Climate, and Local Action, ICLA, of the Secretary General's 2019 Climate Action Summit. The implementation of building climate resilience of the urban poor, the BCRUP initiative which Kenya committed to champion will lead to improved lives and livelihoods for an estimated 600 million to 1 billion dollars and will require political commitment and collaboration among stakeholders. And this mass characterized post-COVID pandemic initiatives at the national, regional and multilateral levels. We reiterate the call by His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta during his UNGA speech during the high level segment that there is urgent need to better fund and strengthen UN Habitat and UNEP to enable them to deliver better post-COVID-19 recovery. Kenya as host country to UNEP, UN Habitat, and the United Nations at Nairobi remains committed to facilitate a conducive environment for UNEP and UN Habitat in Nairobi. And as I conclude, I would like us to remember that COVID-19 has adversely impacted both the rich and poor and has highlighted the central role of partnerships across four sectors and between the North and South as no country can do it alone. Let us leverage these immense opportunities for collaborations to build back better collaboratively and inclusively. I thank you, Asanteni. Thank you very much, um, uh, Susan Wangi. It's very nice to hear from you, and we really uh, appreciate uh, the support from uh, the government of Kenya 
as the host of the United Nations uh, Human Settlements Program in Nairobi uh, and your active uh, support uh, together with Ambassador Njambi um, uh, in, in enabling UN Habitat to be more effective both in the governance structure as well as um, here in New York. Thank you. Um, I now turn to Ambassador um, Amal uh, Mudalali, the permanent representative of Lebanon uh, to the United Nations here in New York. Uh, Ambassador, over to you. Hello, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, dear Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, uh, dear UN Habitat Exec Director, Ms. Maimouna Sharif, uh, Excellencies, it's a great honor and pleasure to be part of this panel on post pandemic cities with an important theme of housing for all, a better urban future. Thanks for UN Habitat for organizing this important panel. It's very critical to start preparing now during this pandemic for what kind of cities we want and what should be what would, should be our priorities in building after this pandemic. Lebanon is grateful for including us in this panel because our challenges preceded the pan pandemic and became more severe with devastating consequences for its people after the August 4 Beirut explosion. We have now a triple crisis. We have now a triple crisis, financial crisis, COVID-19 pandemic, and the Beirut explosion. As you all know, when the explosion ripped at the heart of Beirut, shattering lives and livelihoods, the Lebanese were reeling under the heavy weight of these crises. The rapid and effective response of the whole UN system was exemplary. From help with emergency relief to recovery and help with restoration of crit critical mm -hmm. services and helping people pick up not the shattered glass that covered the face of the city, but also to put their lives together, UN Habitat was there from the first moment of the response. We thank you for that. Immediately after the explosion, UN Habitat deployed technical teams to the municipalities of Beirut and Burj Hammoud, the most impacted by the explosion. They helped with rapid building level damage assessments, digitizing and mapping data, and producing two reports on the degree of damage incurred in both municipalities, which helps target the most impacted areas. This is in addition to a socioeconomic mapping which is help, helpful in identifying the most vulnerable. UN Habitat also provided a cash for rent for 800 families whose houses were damaged by the explosion. This, we are told, will be complemented by protection and health awareness, and, and UN Habitat is, uh, is co-leading the shelter sector response to the BLAST and co-chairing a housing and property technical committee. Unfortunately, many, many schools were damaged during the explosion, and we are grateful that UN Habitat is working on assessments of 100 plus private schools. The area most affected, the old center of Beirut, is the historic heart of Beirut and the historic and heritage buildings that are that the memory of Beirut and its history are damaged or destroyed. We commend UN Habitat for engaging with the other UN partners to develop an urban recovery framework that was used in other conflict areas like Syria and Yemen to ensure an area based approach to recovery, engaging at the community level and ensuring connectivity across neighborhoods. The most important part of this approach is that it goes beyond addressing the blast and its aftermath. It addresses the pre-existing complex urban challenges faced in Beirut, addressing heritage, housing, building back better, making environmental and social aspects an important component of the building, rebuilding. UN Habitat is also engaged fully with the CRF strategy, reform, recovery and reconstruction, which is undertaken by the United Nations, the World Bank, and the EU. This is in addition to its help in the COVID-19 response. Mr. President, we have been told that Beirut was destroyed and rebuilt several, seven times in its history, showcasing the resilience of the Lebanese. The explosion amplified the existing problems of the city of Beirut. And it's important when rebuilding the city to rebuild better because the way you rebuild the heart of a city will determine how healthy the rest of the city and the country will be. People have to be at the center of the rebuilding, which ensures an inclusive, smart, and sustainable future for the city and its inhabitants. We need to build also in a way to preserve the memory of the city and its heritage and make it accessible and affordable to all. People are suffering financially and replacing one window, one window in Beirut costs more than the monthly minimum wage of a poor family. The cost of basic materials needed to rebuild homes and businesses is out of reach for thousands of people. 
they need assistance, not only to rebuild their homes, but more importantly, to rebuild their shattered lives. The role of UN Habitat and the UN system is critical here to help guide the strategy of rebuilding better, even in situations of screen difficulties. Derek Thompson wrote in the Atlantic magazine that the 21st century city is the child of catastrophe, that natural and man-made cities and our ideas about human progress for millennia, that visionary responses to catastrophes have changed city life for the better. Beirut is not new to rising after disasters. It will rise again, but how it rises and with whom is critical to the future of the city and its people. We count on you to be with us and we walk this path to rebuild a better city and a more sustainable and humane, humane city and world. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Mudalali, uh, for your kind words and uh, profound thoughts in terms of how, how we move forward in cities um, in the context uh, of, di of disasters of multiple forms, uh, not confined to explosions as experienced in Beirut, uh, but challenges of inequality, economic development, uh, and transformation. Um, I now turn to uh, the uh, president of the American Institute of Architects, uh, Jane Frederick. Over to you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to all across the nation and around the world for joining this vital discussion. We each have a unique role to play in creating a world that is more sustainable and equitable. For my organization, that means transforming the built environment through holistic solutions to fight climate change and create the safe, healthy community everyone deserves. AIA has a number of tools and programs to do that. We just updated our AIA framework for design excellence, a resource with tools and strategies to pursue a built environment that's zero carbon, equitable, resilient, and healthy. One of the ways the building community can turn the framework into measurable action is through our 2030 commitment. The 2030 commitment is a platform for architects engineers and owners to work toward together to achieving a carbon neutral built environment by the year 2030. We just released the latest numbers from 2019 and it was our best year yet. A record 682 architecture firms representing over 100 countries participated last year and signatories recorded a 49% reduction in predicted energy use intensity. That's the greatest reduction in the program's history. The equivalent of avoiding 20 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. As we focus on post pandemic cities today, it's important to realize just how much climate progress we can achieve through green design. As much as 50% of a city's greenhouse gas emissions can be produced by fewer than 5% of that city's buildings. Of course, we also know that climate and health are connected and that crises in both realms hit our most vulnerable communities the hardest. As the world focuses on adapting the built environment to stop the spread of coronavirus, we have an unprecedented opportunity to aim bigger and adapt our communities to achieve lasting change. The most effective changes are those driven by local communities themselves. That fact is at the heart of AIA Center for Communities by Design. This initiative has been helping communities design a better future for more than 50 years, pairing volunteer teams of experts with local residents. Together, we find design solutions to tackle challenges like zoning, affordable housing, revitalization, historic preservation, and of course, climate related challenges like disaster recovery, resilient design, and sustainable communities. All communities need and deserve spaces that are healthy, equitable, and safe. We've seen growing public recognition of that truth, first through the COVID crisis, and then through the largest civil rights demonstrations in decades. We'll only overcome these multifaceted global challenges by joining forces to implement multi-pronged solutions, working together, 
I'm confident we'll succeed in achieving meaningful, lasting change. Very much, um, uh, Jane Frederick. It's, it's, it's terrific to hear um, your intervention um, at, at the level of the American Institute of Architects uh, and the efforts that you are taking uh, as professional associations uh, to move forward this agenda. And I think it complements very nicely uh, the interventions we heard from the permanent representatives in the UN system here. Um, I'm now going to shift to uh, Kim Yao, who is uh, uh, head of the New York chapter of the American Institute of Architects close to home here in the United Nations. Over to you, Kim. Thank you very much, Chris. The almost 6,000 members of the American Institute of Architects New York City chapter share the city of New York with the United Nations. We applaud that the United Nations is addressing critical issues facing the world today. Thank you for convening for this important discussion. Back in 2019, New York was entering a decade already defined by extremes with accelerating ecological, economic, and political crises. The 2020 arrival of COVID-19 to the United States has further revealed widening gaps of equity and access in our communities. The crises and challenges that face New Yorkers, natural disaster, climate change, threats to public health, require the attention of the public in general and design professionals more specifically. Architecture is fundamentally an interdisciplinary and collaborative field where design thinking and broad engagement yield spaces that improve the daily lives of people. Can the pandemic be a catalyst for our profession to embrace the challenge of making cities denser, healthier, and more sustainable? How will we, will we meaningfully gather as communities? And what are the implications for our conception of public space? In city, we are galvanized around these questions. The Unified Task Force of AIA New York and, and AIA New York State formed immediately in the wake of the pandemic to partner with city and state officials in facing public health, climate resilience, housing, and equity challenges. Our design core is partnered with New York City by Design and the New York City Economic Development Corporation to connect restaurant owners with design professionals who can insist with ongoing reopening plans. All exhibit Visualize NYC 2021 uses research, data analysis, and visualization to explore pressing questions for our city with a focus on the evolving public realm, a fundamental right to housing, climate change and resilience, and public health. These research areas directly intersect UN Sustainable Development Goal number 11, to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. We will NYC 2021 is a tool for broader civic en engagement by asking visitors for feedback on these issues, in turn informing our advocacy work and priorities for 2021. This is critical strategic importance given the current significant economic downturn that will challenge the city to create meaningful change with restricted resources. As cities continue to densify and environmental pressure down, how do we evolve our thinking to make the future city more adaptable and resilient? While we cannot control the crises that we face, we can thoughtfully work on planning, anticipating, and creating our better future city, and we look forward to engaging in this work together with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Kim, and um, it's, it's great to hear that um, you were directly involved in supporting the city of New York and the state of New York in, uh, on behalf of the architectural community in response to COVID. And I think this kind of collaboration between professionals and government uh, is encouraging. Um, I now turn to Lance Brown, um, the pre uh, president of the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization. And I refer to him uh, in, this, uh, in this meeting as the architect of architects, uh, helping to manage and organize this event. Uh, Lance, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning to everyone. My name is Lance J. Brown. I'm the president of the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization, partners with United uh, Nations Habitat and co-organizers of today's program. We're truly honored to have this program introduced by the president of the United Nations General Assembly, the executive director of UN Habitat, and the permanent representatives from Lebanon, Slovakia, and Kenya, 
as well as our presidents of the American Institute of Architects. This is an important time for the UN as we celebrate its 75th anniversary. It is the one forum where 193 world nations come together to improve the quality of life for us all. We congratulate them during this most important year and look forward to continuing to work together. We are also pleased to announce in celebration of the 75th anniversary, our CSU publication entitled Sustainable Urbanization at the United Nations for Architects and Design Professionals, written by founding board member Alia Pichelik and currently available on our website, no charge. We want to thank the president of the National AAA and the local chapter for insights they delivered on how design professionals pursue our health, safety, and welfare on the global, national, and local levels, and how these pursuits will determine the quality of life to which we aspire, from our public landscape to our health and educational institutions and our communities and residences. We depend on the talent, skills, and abilities and commitment of the design professionals to deliver affordable, energy conscious, resilient, and yes, beautiful environments. We also want to thank today's keynote and panel speakers for sharing their thoughts about the ways we can best move forward in our post-pandemic world. We're experiencing a confluence of related challenges beyond anything seen by humankind. The CSU has endeavored to fully engage the design communities in the SDGs especially SDG 11, in all of our activities. It's our hope that during the course of today's presentations and discussions, we will all add to our arsenal of positive responses to the many challenges we face. While daunting, we hope that we can meet these challenges with the optimism and hope that defines us, and with the courage and capacity and creativity we have exhibited throughout our history. We have serious choices ahead. We hope we will make the right decisions informed by shared, transparent, scientific knowledge and the equitable use of resources that will ensure our well being for generations to come. I would like to close by reminding us all that we will have a CSU inaugural lecture by Champion Awardee Claire Weiss entitled Millennium Thinking this Wednesday. Please register on our website. Please now welcome back Chris Williams. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Lance, um, and thank you for uh, your collaboration in, in pulling this meeting together. Um, I just will put a footnote to uh, listeners who are perhaps newer to the Consortium on Sustainable Organization than others. Um, they have been able to uh, recently join uh, the Habitat Professionals Forum, uh, which is comprised of professional architects, planners, realtors uh, from around the world as a key constituent of the new urban agenda. And uh, UN Habitat has been working actively since the establishment of the United Nations Habitat Assembly in May of 2019 to revisit and strengthen uh, the various constituencies of the new urban agenda, of which professionals are extremely important. So thank you, Lance, for your efforts and uh, this meeting and broader efforts within the professionals, among the professionals. Um, I now turn uh, the moderation over to um, uh, 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 Mary Stack, who will be uh, serving as a moderator uh, for um, the keynote addresses and uh, panel presentations. And I would like to thank uh, once again uh, the speakers that we've heard, the executive director, uh, the permanent representatives of Lebanon, Kenya, um, as, as well as uh, uh, Slovak Republic, and of course um, our esteemed colleagues from uh, the American Institute of Architects, national and local, and of course, Consortium on Sustainable Organization. With that, um, thanks everyone, and I please uh, request Mary to take us forward. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director of Cambridge Forum. Um, I'm very proud and honored to be involved in today's important event. Before we hear from our keynote speakers, we are pleased to share with you a two minute trailer for the film, The Human Shelter, an inspirational exploration filmed um, in a number of four continents, taking the public to extreme social, economic and environmental conditions worldwide and presenting a series of testimonies that look at various dimensions of human living. Boris Bertram's film investigates the question of what makes a home 
and explores different people's ways of creating their homes around the globe. あの、Lutre, جبتها من هناك وياي من جيت من صلاح الدين ربحت في هذا المخيم هو أن نجيت أنا وعائلتي من الموت في هذا المقام البيت مكان بيت مكان الذي أعيش فيه ساعدوني ساعدوني حتى ساعدوني إلى أن أصل إلى مجتمع. Thank you. Today, UN Habitat launched Housing for All, which is a five-week campaign calling for action to improve housing conditions worldwide. The central message of the campaign is that housing is not just a roof, it's a human right and contributes to health, dignity, safety, inclusion and well-being. The films will be made available to everyone, free, online, starting today until the 6th of November 2020, on the UN Habitat's YouTube channel. We're now moving on to our keynote addresses, which will be given in two parts by Mr. Jeffrey Sachs and Mr. Peter Calthorpe. If attendees would like to pose questions, please use the chat room and specify who the question's for. We will endeavor to select a few questions, time permitting at the end of the presentations. Mr. Jeffrey Sachs is widely recognized as one of the most influential economists in the world today and one of the most respected voices advocating for urgent environmental action. He's a professor at Columbia and former director of the Earth Institute. As an author and editor of several New York Times bestsellers, his influence is far reaching. Mr. Sachs has just been appointed to chair the Lancet COVID-19 Commission to assist government, civil society, and UN entities to respond effectively to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, he will be speaking about reflections on urbanization in a post-pandemic world. We welcome Mr. Jeffrey Sachs. Have we got Mr. Sachs? I don't see him in, in the list here. Perhaps we, we should move forward to Peter Cathor. Okay, let's hope we can get him at some point. 
Uh, so we're going to move on to the next segment, um, which is um, speaking to Peter Calthorpe. He is an honored architect, urbanist, and author whose prescient design work has had a global impact. As one of the founders of the new urbanism, he espouses principles that have informed the design of successful neighborhoods in towns and metro regions. His work demonstrates that diversity of use and users, human interaction and environmental sustainability can coexist. His work in China and elsewhere demonstrates that low carbon cities can be vibrant places to live, work and play. Today, Mr. Calthorpe will be speaking about planning for resilient cities. Welcome, Mr. Calthorpe. Well, um, I'm going to jump right into my slides and perhaps uh, be a bit disruptive. I, I, I don't think COVID-19 is going to be transformative to cities. As a matter of fact, I think it's a misnomer that uh, cities are particularly vulnerable more than other places. Most studies show that density is not related to um, the spread of COVID. It has to do with public policy and uh, access to medical treatments and many other factors. But the main risk factor is not the essence of the urban environment. Um, this is just a quote from a 119, uh, 913 studies. If you look across various other cities, you discover that there's a huge variation in morbidity rates uh, in relationship to density. Um, and so we understand clearly that the urban form itself is not uh, a major factor. Uh, the major factors are, of course, uh, how people behave, what kind of public policy is put in place, uh, and what kind of uh, medical accessibility is made present. So I actually wanted to talk today about a bigger virus, a more systemic virus, a, vi a virus that's long term. It's called urban sprawl and it's infecting cities around the globe as we uh, shift dramatically to an urban planet. Uh, there are estimates anywhere from two and a half to three and a half billion more people will be living in cities by the year 2050. And how we build those cities is really at the heart of uh, human well-being and, and environmental sustainability. Um, as we shape cities, we shape our behavior. And as we shape our behavior, uh, we shape our impacts. This is an anecdote of something that um, has been said many times. So ending global sprawl, I think, is at the heart of this. Now, Sprawl comes in many forms, uh, but in all cases, cities, we all know, are the centers of our global progress. I mean, innovation, it's where the rural poor go to find employment and uh, better services and health care and education. It's where growth happens on the planet. It's actually the lower carbon way to live. And, of course, it begins to deal with um, uh, population expansion and um, the access of women in the workplace and their rights and education and literacy. Literature. We understand cities do all of these things and they are why they have become the center of gravity for progress and, and the future of mankind. They're also where our greatest challenges sit. And of course, Habitat focuses on housing and homelessness, but it's where our Climate change impacts are, are felt and generated most significantly. Um, the segregation and racism is, is often played out in our urban environments and poverty, uh, inequality, and community and livability. These are all the things that are affected by the physical form, as well as the public policies that um, sit at the foundation of earth, the urban environment. I believe there are three types of this urban virus I call sprawl. One is high income sprawl, which we think of as low density sprawl in North America. It's a landscape of subdivisions and shopping malls, something fabricated since World War II based on um, public policy and infrastructure investment in freeways, cars, and home, uh, home insurance mortgage. 
A more recent version, of course, has emerged in the East, uh, largely in China, high density sprawl. And it shows clearly that uh, density and, and sprawl uh, can cohabitate in super blocks uh, surrounded by large uh, arterials. It's the fundamental disaggregation of the function of neighborhoods and cities that uh, make this a viral form of urban growth. And then perhaps the most ubiquitous on the planet is low income sprawl. The, the, the uh, addition of uh, informal housing and communities at the regional periphery on the cheap land, but still most distant from um, access to jobs, opportunity, and culture. Each one of these forms is debilitating environmentally, socially, and economically. I think that there are universal solutions or principles that urban form can address in all these three cases. Um, the first, and I'll just run through them and then show a series of examples of how, um, how all this plays out. Um, the first is to preserve natural ecology, the agrarian landscape, established neighbors, and cultural heritage. Understanding the value of what is in and around the city is step one uh, of creating a healthy urban form. Urban growth boundaries, uh, and minimum densities, uh, um, pre preservation of ag lands at the periphery. These are... Um, uh, this is a step that's really fundamental to any healthy city, and it's the most difficult because, of course, sprawl is made out of a blindness to the value of habitat uh, and aquifers and, and um, uh, wetlands and uh, natural environments. Mixed use is always at the heart of great cities. And a lot of these principles are things that most designers understand. Um, maybe policymakers don't completely understand it, but the, the, what underlines this particular idea of mixed use is that you have to design cities of one neighborhood at a time, not one project at a time. And it's also important that each one of these principles has measurable um, uh, metrics so that it's not just a vague, uh, feel good statement. It's actually something that can be part of legal documents, planning documents, connections. The scale of city blocks determines the walkability of neighborhoods and the walkability of neighborhoods determines the social uh, health of the place. Uh, adequate gathering spaces. These are all things that are tragically overlooked with the rush to development and the uh, informal development that typically happens. Um, having close by public services and, and open space is critical to the health of every neighborhood, every component of the city. Walking and biking is at the heart of a healthy city. Uh, we've tended to destroy these environments uh, by favoring the automobile globally. At this point, we're trying to reinsert them, but they are at the heart of uh, healthy neighborhoods, districts, and cities. Transit is the only mobility future that is sustainable. The idea of one person, one car uh, is not a strategy, even if it has no steering wheel um, that will function uh, in a healthy city. And finally, we need to organize our cities around those transit networks, not around freeways and interchanges, which has been the norm for too long. Let me give you a few examples. Mexico City uh, is a good example of low income sprawl. Our analytical tools let us look very quickly at how a city is shaped demographically. And here's a picture of the, uh, uh, the city. The wealthy, of course, sit at the center uh, and the poor sit at the periphery, uh, making their access to culture and history and economic opportunity marginalized. This is where the jobs are. Once again, the wealthy uh, live near the jobs. The jobs are at the center where the cultural heritage sits and the poor live more and more in, in, in greater and greater distances. As a matter of fact, in Mexico City, it's not atypical for 
working class people to travel three hours a day each direction. Uh, and this, of course, leads to the kind of congestion that not only disenfranchises the poor, but of course, uh, reduces the functionality of the total city through con massive congestion. We were able to just do a quick survey of the map and identify four types of areas, those with transit, those with walkability, and those with none of the above. Um, and it turns out that over uh, two thirds of the population doesn't have access to adequate transit or is within walking distance of their significant destinations. These are fundamental flaws of the sprawling city. We're now working for the World Bank on a master planning in the um, Ho Chi Minh City area. And it's a good example of maybe how these principles can be applied uh, at that scale. It is like many uh, growing economic uh, environments in the global south, uh, massive acceleration of growth, particularly at the periphery of the city uh, over time. Um, and as that is happening, the growth is spreading into flood prone areas. Uh, this is, it goes back to that principle number one, let's preserve a habitat that needs to be preserved. Well, certainly floodplains are that for many, many reasons. A recent McKinsey study showed that if the current development trends weren't redirected up to 18 billion in buildings and 7 billion in infrastructure would be uh, 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 chronically flooded uh, by 2050 and up to 40 billion in economic impact knock, knock on effects would, would result. Cities can't afford to ignore their natural environment. And so the plans that are being put forward now are about identifying safe and resilient sites, existing development around 400 square kilometers already in floodplain in this city. Many other cities around the globe have this pathology, but making it even worse, of course, is another 560 square kilometers in, uh, uh, that are planned for growth in, uh, to the south of the city core into the uh, floodplain areas. We've been able to identify three major areas that can accommodate up to 4 million population growth easily, all on high ground. It's a matter of redirecting infrastructure and redirecting planning policy to move development into those areas. These kinds of cities need a, a low carbon transport system. Um, more, just more freeways and metro, which is very expensive, necessary, but perhaps out of the reach of many of the developing uh, cities around the world. What are the alternatives to these uh, two um, options, freeways and, uh, and expensive metro? Well, if you understand that 90% of the trips in a place like uh, Vietnam are on motorcycles, uh, and you do the numbers to discover that actually uh, we all lo love and praise bicycles as a ecological means of micro mobility. Well, those motorcycles, if electrified, uh, can carry as many or more passengers per lane per hour as many forms of mass transit, light rail and BRT included. So here's a cheap uh, indigenous um, trans mobility option uh, that can satisfy a lot of needs without a lot of expense. Um, it's this kind of uh, specific thinking that has to happen. We're proposing a grid of one way streets that are limited just to electric motorcycles. And as you may know, electric motorcycles have become the norm in China very rapidly, and they can be so throughout the world. Uh, given a private lane, mobility becomes fluid and congestion disappears. And so you can see at a, at a district scale, a network of uh, 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 motorcycle only streets. This is just one example of the way we have to think creatively about mobility and housing and urban design. 
Um, these streets, of course, uh, wouldn't suffer from the congestion caused by mixing trucks and buses and cars. Uh, the ecological systems has to be at the heart of where these how these cities grow. And of course, uh, just building beyond floodplain doesn't resolve all the issues. Uh, drainage is it is terribly important, and how that drainage interacts with the peripheral green belts, the green belts preserving the wetlands, the mangrove forests, and the agriculture. There's simple ways of integrating all these things, and it does go to public policy more than anything else. Uh, powerful um, planning institutions and coherent investment strategies have to back up better urban form. Um, in a wet climate like this, the design, the micro design of streets and how drainage works there and the macro design of neighborhoods to have enough open space for detention and drainage, terribly important to the health of the city. And complete neighborhoods, affordable housing. For too long, the uh, self-built housing, which, you know, uh, informal housing in Vietnam is between 50 and 70 percent of all buildings. Uh, but isolating that kind of housing just creates social isolation uh, that uh, makes households less successful in integrating into the larger economy. So each neighborhood needs to be thought of as a place for every type of housing from the high end to the affordable and also a place in which all the local destinations, schools and shops and clinics and community centers. Uh, these are still fairly simple planning uh, principles that can be put in place in every growing city. Finally, in this particular domain, heat island effect is terribly important. And so we can watch the spread of these, these heat events uh, exacerbated by poor urban form. Ventilation through the city, and of course, the simple and profound, um, you know, use of trees as uh, as shading devices and transpiration uh, is at the heart of that kind of thing. So, if you planned a district, it would have these layers: an open space network that connects from the periphery to the interior, a network of auto-free streets to allow uh, alternative transportation modes neighborhood centers and coherent and complete neighborhoods, a transit network, um, and uh, on-site employment. We know how to do these things. Um, High-density sprawl comes from an old paradigm of super blocks, massive freeways and towers. Um, and to a certain degree, China has perfected this. Um, it is a placeless environment in which the pedestrian has no traction, no sidewalks here, no shops, uh, but high density. Uh, this is literally a model of a, of a community uh, that we worked to redesign in Kuming, super blocks at a quarter mile per side. Um, and we found that you could reconfigure it into something like this, human scale walkable streets and mixed use using exactly the same investment. Um, and, and the same amount of roads. So it's a configurational issue, not an economic issue. We applied these in large study areas. This is a study area in uh, Chongqing for 4 million people. Um, of course, always starting with the natural environment and what needs to be preserved, and then overlaying a network of metro lines and walking radiuses around the metro lines show that just about every uh, place in this development zone would be easily walking distance to Metro. Now, remember, most cities in China only have about a 30% auto ownership rate right now. So we're dealing with the mobility of the 70%. And uh, there's a reason for lots of investment there. The individual neighborhoods, of course, become more diverse because they have different kinds of housing and more human scale because they have smaller blocks and walkable streets. Um, this is a before and after. I won't go into it, but the before, of course, is all housing in one area, all jobs in another, as opposed to the kind of mixed use that great cities always have. 
But this green map just shows the Avon, not only the open space and parks, but also the auto-free streets that um, inform this community. Um, this is a rendering of one of these auto-free streets, as I mentioned, with only 30% auto ownership. Why not give some streets to transit, bikes, and pedestrians only? Um, it's a simple strategy uh, that can have huge impacts. And most of these policies are now adopted in China at large. They understood the uh, malignancy of the super block approach and have shifted dramatically in their central uh, urban uh, city development policies. As a matter of fact, they actually allocate funds for uh, infrastructure based on the mode split uh, targets. So if, if the target is 30% transit mode split, then there's adequate dollars for that transit investment. I'll close with uh, the North American high income sprawl. Um, I think we're all quite familiar with this. We did some years ago a study for the state of California asking where the next 10 million people would go in sprawl or into more compact mixed use walkable communities. And we using a urban footprint as a tool to analyze this, we did two hypothetical scenarios, business as usual, 70% uh, sprawl subdivisions, malls and office parks versus a growing smart strategy, which was 50% compact neighborhoods, not very dense, only 35% urban. And the differences are astounding. This is the LA region under a small, a sprawl future. And this is under a compact future, same population. But what's most important here is that this kind of transformation impacts many layers of well-being for our people anywhere in the world. Greenhouse gas emissions are reduced dramatically uh, because of more compact communities allow less auto dependence. Uh, vehicle miles travel went down dramatically, even in a place like LA, uh, which of course translates into household costs. Uh, building energy goes down naturally because compact buildings are uh, more uh, envelope efficient. Uh, respiratory health is directly related to air quality and mobility. And what I don't have here, of course, is, is obesity rates and heart disease, all of which are related to the shape of the city. Infrastructure cost goes down, obviously, with more compact development. Here's a big one, though. For California, where we all experienced the 2008 um, financial collapse based on the underlying reality that the American working class could no longer afford a distant um, house on a cul-de-sac in, in a subdivision, uh, a long drive from their job. Um, $10,000 per annum saving on a median income of 50,000, which globally seems uh, extravagant is a really big number. And this comes about merely by savings in mobility and utility costs. And land consumption for every environmentalist or advocate for agriculture, these are really big, important numbers. The choices are huge. Um, and what it points out is that urban, um, urban systems are nested. Uh, we address many, many issues simultaneously. Uh, not just climate change, not just affordable housing, um, not just uh, 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 energy demands and, and congestion and ag preservation and habitat. They all are linked um, through the shape and the impacts of urban form. So with that, I'll leave us all with Winston Churchill's great thought. Um, I would substitute cities for the word building in this particular uh, case. But I think our greater pathology, the long-term issues that we have to confront have to do with a virus that's not COVID in this particular case, but a virus in the way we think about and build cities. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Peter, for that wonderful um, presentation. Um, we now find that we've got Mr. Jeffrey Sachs uh, live, so I'm going to give him a brief intro again. Jeffrey Sachs is widely recognized as one of the most influential economists in the world today, 
and one of the most respected voices advocating for urgent environmental action. He's a professor at Columbia and former director of the Earth Institute. As an author and editor of several New York Times bestsellers, his influence is far reaching. Mr. Sachs has just been appointed to chair the Lancet COVID-19 Commission to assist government, civil society and UN entities to respond effectively to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, he will be speaking about reflections on urbanization in a post-pandemic world. Welcome, Mr. Jeffrey Sachs. Thank you very much. Uh, and sorry for the delay of uh, getting there, but I think things worked out much better with Peter speaking first. First of all, he knows what he's talking about, and I'm a, a consumer of his wisdom uh, rather than the other way around. But uh, the issues that he raised are really uh, paramount uh, for us and for achieving sustainable development. So I want to underscore some and ask a few questions, actually, uh, also of uh, Peter, if I might, uh, because we need his vision and expertise in this. It seems to me that uh, we've uh, learned one uh, major thing from COVID that we could have known uh, beforehand, but uh, it will be core for urban design and economic design after, and that is that we are absolutely uh, in the digital age in every kind of service and uh, every uh, aspect of the economy. Uh, we will be working from home to a much, much larger extent. We'll be working online. We will not be using our office buildings uh, in the same way uh, probably like most of you, I've not been to my office since uh, uh, the beginning of March, and I don't expect to be in my office uh, through the end of this year. Uh, and yet work is uh, basically as busy as ever uh, or busier. And uh, I was just reading uh, in the Financial Times this morning that law firms are booming. Uh, they're all working from home, uh, but they're doing more work and more turnover. Uh, they will empty out uh, a lot of the office space in downtown New York. Uh, certainly, we basically have almost a ghost town in New York right now in midtown Manhattan, but I think it's likely to continue. The digital backbone is therefore paramount. Fortunately, it's possible to put in fiber and cable in an urban area at quite low cost. Uh, compared to the benefits and uh, to pay for that commercially. Uh, it seems to me that a starting point for thinking about uh, future cities is what's going to be online uh, and what's going to be in the physical environment. I'm pretty sure, for example, that uh, commerce will be substantially online in the future, that the move to e-commerce is not just a convenience uh, of uh, people locking down in COVID, but is actually a far more efficient way to get goods to people by and large. Uh, it's just, a, I would guess, lower uh, aggregate to transport to have uh, Amazon warehouses uh, and uh, fulfillment centers uh, shipping goods directly to households rather than people going out uh, getting in cars and driving to shops uh, and back. And so pretty simple programming problem uh, in some simple illustrative cases, e-commerce is just a lot more efficient in resource use, land use, time use, and, and so on. And I think that that will fundamentally change uh, also what cities mean. If we're not going to offices, if we're not using shops the same way that we did in the past, uh, the, the kind of uh, structures that we'll want will be very, very different. Peter talked about uh, the fact that car ownership is 30% uh, of households. I, I think if I heard him correctly, or maybe it's 30 per 100 uh, population. I'm not sure what the number is exactly uh, in the Chinese cities. I would ask the question, do we need private car ownership at all in the future? Uh, shouldn't we be aiming actually to eliminate almost all private car ownership, period, for two reasons. One, we'll need fewer trips, three reasons, fewer trips, 
Second, uh, more non-automotive trips. And third, moving to a share vehicle economy uh, where we use vehicles on demand uh, for the hour a day we may be riding in the aggregate rather than owning the vehicles, finding places to park the vehicles, uh, we would be uh, simply uh, jumping into vehicles that we pick up on the side of the road and deposit someplace or uh, uh, call uh, hailing service uh, or what is more likely 15 years from now, especially with urban design, autonomous vehicles coming to fetch us uh, and uh, dropping us off uh, just by uh, phone app uh, or mobile app. And so it seems to me we should be actively pursuing a policy of, uh, if not minimizing automobile use, basically assuming away private car ownership for people who live in high density urban areas. It's my great joy in New York City not to have a car, and I hope never to have a car again. Uh, it's been a great pleasure for the last 20 years not to own an automobile, and uh, it's it been only a great convenience and a saving of income not to own an automobile. This would help leapfrogging of economic development considerably if we were not aiming at raising income sufficiently so that people can buy cars, but just uh, having income sufficient so that people can get transport services, including autonomous vehicles carrying them one place or another. I think that this would be a, a huge plus. And if we're commuting to offices much less, if we're commuting to shops much less, if uh, there is car sharing, car hailing, uh, and autonomy of vehicles, it seems to me uh, I'd like designers uh, like Peter uh, to tell us, could we have cities without any car, private car ownership, just fleets at a much lower uh, density and still be providing the aggregate transport services that we need? A another consideration uh, clearly is that we'll move to all electric cities, uh, the idea of burning biomass, coal, heating oil, natural gas inside our city seems to me also to be both unnecessary and antiquated uh, because of climate considerations, air pollution considerations, uh, improvements of building design, better insulation, uh, electric heat pump technology improvements, uh, electric cooking improvements and the like. We probably can have an all electric energy system for our cities. And that's another basic grid uh, that can be put in place at relatively low cost per person if amortized over uh, the life of an investment with the kinds of capital costs we now face one or 2% interest rates on 30 year uh, borrowing uh, for safe uh, borrowing. Uh, the digital backbone and the all-electric backbone seem to me to work uh, very well together. Uh, I don't know what the design of cities would be in an all-electric, digital, e-commerce driven uh, economy. I've not seen anybody scope out such a city in the way that Peter just showed us models for China, but I bet he's got some ideas about that. Uh, I'd like to know with the lower density of shops, uh, a lower density of office buildings, uh, thinking about our residential design in a way to add some space for work from home so that this isn't just a haphazard idea, but it's understood that when you buy your flat or rent your flat, it's partly got the uh, wired facilities for effective online work. Um, what would a city look like in that case? A lot greener, uh, obviously, uh, a lot more uh, walkable areas, uh, a lot cleaner air, and my guess is a lot cheaper to live in. So uh, this would be a huge benefit. Rather than raising GDP, we would lower costs. Okay, it's the same thing. We would uh, raise uh, uh, our uh, Effectively, uh, we, we would raise uh, incomes not by 
the metrics that we're using now, but by the uh, services uh, being dramatically improved at lower cost. I'm uh, intrigued by the question of how housing fits into this. Uh, affordable housing seems to me to be a pretty fundamental uh, part of this story. We don't seem to do it well in the United States uh, where the uh, mythology has remained uh, private home ownership. Uh, but for most of cities uh, in the future, it will be in flats uh, that are, if done well, living in, in very uh, uh, quality uh, living conditions uh, and at uh, low cost, at uh, much lower cost. I'd like to know whether there are ways to dramatically lower the cost of housing services in the same way that there are now ways to dramatically lower the cost of transport services or uh, commuting time or shopping costs and so forth. What are the technological opportunities to lower significantly uh, housing costs per unit of effective housing service. From my point of view, it's a big gap in, in my understanding uh, because we have much less discussion about that in the policy domain than we do about other things, energy transformation, uh, transport transformation, uh, e-governance, and so on. I don't know what the answers are in affordable housing the same way, but I would love to uh, hear about that. Um, obviously, if we have an all digital, all electric, low automobile, e-commerce, affordable housing uh, uh, framework, the opportunity for higher quality of life is, uh, is evident. Uh, and uh, I was glad to see uh, just now Peter's discussion of uh, the Chinese uh, cities, uh, which are awful in the uh, traditional design from the 1950s to the, ninth, to, to the end of uh, the 20th century, absolutely unlivable. Uh, get in a car and drive 30 miles uh, and uh, no place to walk, unpleasant, no mixed use, uh, and so on. And I was happy to hear that there's a lot more attention to this quality of life uh, because my experience with China's urban development goes back to 1980, and I watched horrible cities go up uh, with very low quality of life on the ground, um, unnecessarily, actually. I think the final question that I would ask is, what could we think about the future uh, size structure of cities? Uh, up until COVID, my prevailing assumption was uh, that we would continue to have densification uh, and uh, large cities, and we would try to make them livable along the lines that I uh, just described. I've always resisted the idea that uh, we would have a de-densification because of the digital world, but I'm not absolutely so sure anymore uh, with the COVID experience. It seems to me that one of the things that's happening is that the advantages, say, of New York City compared to a middle-sized city in terms of where to uh, operate service uh, sector industries has diminished because of uh, the rapid digitalization. And when we look at what's happening to rents across the United States, they're collapsing in the big cities uh, much more than they are in the mid-sized cities. Maybe that is a harbinger of more attractiveness of middle-sized cities uh, in a more digital world uh, where we don't need the, uh, uh, the, the huge uh, intensity of office space of a Midtown or uh, Wall Street, uh, um, Midtown Manhattan or, or Wall Street structure. Now that people really can work from home, uh, and 80% of the business can still uh, remain that way. People don't want to commute uh, an hour and a half to New York, whether by train or by car. Um, maybe they do want to live in a place and uh, call in uh, for their work. 
since we're going to be living in a more service-based economy in the future, certainly, uh, the question of what this means for the network of cities and the relative uh, attractiveness of high density versus medium, or not high density, large size versus medium size versus small size cities, I think uh, is, an, is an important question for lots of developing countries, which are right now, say, 40% or 50% urban, but are going to be 80% urban by mid-century, meaning that there are billions of people coming to cities. Will they go to capital cities alone? Will they continue to pour into the mega cities, or does the digital possibility change in a fundamental way the relative size structure uh, of uh, of uh, relative productivity of cities according to scale? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's uh, really posed by uh, by COVID nineteen. Well. To my mind, most of the news about city futures is positive, other than the environmental crisis, which is negative for everybody. But most of it's positive because it seems to me what digital, renewable energy, autonomous driving, uh, e-commerce, e-governance allows is a higher quality of life at much, much lower resource use. And so I'm tend to be a techno optimist. Uh, and uh, I think that um, based on the kind of considerations that we heard from uh, Peter uh, just now, designing cities for much, much lower uh, capital investment uh, and uh, basing that on uh, a digital backbone seems to me to offer real opportunities for a higher quality of life in urban areas going forward. Just a few thoughts and mainly a lot of questions. And back to you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Um, that's fascinating. Um, we are going to take some questions from lots of chat room uh, questions that have come in. Um, first, let me just ask um, Peter Calthorpe. Um, He's almost saying that the post pandemic thing has been a kind of distraction with regard to designing the afterlife um, and says that living in California, as he does, um, he finds that he's much more scared about the wildfires than he is about COVID right now. So the emphasis should really be on planning for a climate change world. Uh, with less concerns for the pandemic, which he believes will pass. So I wonder if you could address that. You're asking me, is that right? Uh, actually, Peter. Oh, sorry, yeah. Ignore it, but I think that the, the fixes have to do with pol public policy and behavior patterns and, uh, and uh, medical services, which you know obviously are distributed unevenly and cause problems on that level. But the systemic challenge, of course, is climate change. The systemic uh, challenge is income inequality. It's, the systemic problems are the differences between the wealthy, the growing differences between the wealthy, both within the city and within the globe, and the working poor. Um, you know, we like to paint a picture that people can work from home, but that's for a certain economic class. Uh, there's a massive part of the, our cities and around the planet where people uh, work in the service industries and actually have to go physical locations. I honestly believe that even in the uh, digital economy, people don't people need social interaction. They need social collaboration. Um, I think that we could lead to smaller decentralized shared workspaces that are within walking distance, and that would be a wonderful, healthy outcome. Um, and, but I think that when we look at the larger global city issues, we still have to make a big place for uh, mobility across the city, uh, and that the agglomeration of, of populations actually has a huge positive economic opportunity impact. I, I also want to speak to this autonomous vehicle uh, 
I will say fantasy. All the studies that have been done show that it would generate more vehicle miles traveled have autonomous vehicles. Why? Because uh, of deadheads, what's called deadheads. A vehicle takes you somewhere, drops you off. There's nobody to pick up there. They have to reposition. It's the same thing that happens with taxis. So in terms of auto ownership, that changes. But in terms of the amount of automobile miles driven, which is an environmental catastrophe and a uh, congestion catastrophe, things would be worse. And the numbers show anywhere from 30 to 100%, a doubling of vehicle miles traveled as a result of autonomy. And of course, it would enhance more sprawl, people living greater distances so they could watch TV while they uh, uh, commute, if they still commute. So there's great danger in that. Now, I think that autonomous technology could be put to work in transit systems, and we could have a new generation of transit systems that are uh, more nimble and more complex and more energy efficient um, if they were autonomous. But that's a whole other lecture and discussion. Uh, as for distribution of goods, I totally agree. Uh, bricks and mortar is dead. We have a huge reservoir of commercial land on strips around America. This is the North America phenomenon. Um, and those can be replaced with housing in exactly the right place, mixed use infill uh, on those ribbons, on those arterials uh, can place housing directly adjacent to the kinds of job centers that they need to be close to. So for example, in Silicon Valley near where I live, as a famous road, El Camino, uh, 43 miles could handle a quarter million new housing units, right? through the center of Silicon Valley. So if infill versus uh, out sprawl is the key, then we have a giant um, opportunity by re reallocating the use of that strip commercial, all that asphalt. So I, I think that uh, Jeffrey, everything you said is on target. It's just that maybe there's a different version of it. So autonomous vehicles really need to be thought of as autonomous transit. Um, work at home probably becomes work in the neighborhood um, where you can walk and, and experience a kind of social life. Um, I don't know about you, but I know lots of people are going crazy working at home these days. Um, and and uh, the, the transformation of distribution of goods really can become an opportunity for infill in all the best ways possible. So there's lots of opportunity in each one of these things. Thanks, Peter. Um, I have my own reservations about how quickly pe are people going to want to jump onto the uh, rapid transit in New York City right now. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty isolated. There are very few travelers. But anyway, um, I just wanted to uh, give you a question. Um, actually, this one's from Mr. Sachs. Uh, Rafael Vaquez says, what do you recommend to do with all the accumulated empty space in areas now in midtown Manhattan? Great. Uh, let, let me uh, just uh, answer that, but uh, also uh, just push a, a little bit back on the autonomy. My guess is that in 10 years, uh, uh, when an, there's a direct delivery of goods to uh, my apartment flat, uh, it will be done by a, a little uh, robot kind of delivery. Uh, that's easy. Uh, as long as there's a, a place, a, a strip either on the sidewalk or uh, alongside uh, in dedicated part of the road, finding a way from a fulfillment center to a local warehouse to a, a local delivery will not need a person. Uh, that's a, a big saving. So I see uh, autonomy for uh, retail. Uh, in terms of uh, autonomy for travel, I think with redesign of uh, parts of our city roads, it will look a lot, it will look attractive in uh, significant parts of cities. So it won't be all or nothing, uh, but it will be in certain areas. The technology is just so good already and is going to get a lot better. I think we really will take advantage of it. I'm not convinced, by the way, of those studies uh, that that the real metric is number of uh, passenger miles. 
Uh, there are many different dimensions. How many vehicles do we need? Do we need parking lots? Uh, do we need private ownership uh, rather than uh, uh, rental uh, services? So I, I think we're still with some analysis to be done, in my opinion, on uh, what autonomy will mean. But uh, I guess I'm surrounded by engineers that love it. And so far, they've attracted me to uh, the idea that we can save a lot of money. Uh, by the way, interestingly, if you do autonomous trucking of uh, fleets for intercity travel, the costs of a truck plummet if the trucks are on convoys that don't need drivers in them. So the savings are actually unbelievably large uh, when one starts to think about what autonomous vehicles uh, need. You don't need cabs that have warming, that have meters and dials and uh, safety and, and so on. You just strip down tremendously the cost of the vehicle itself. So you get uh, much cheaper uh, outcomes and the technology is not a challenge. Okay, I think the key point is cities transform, they repurpose. And I imagine that a lot of today's office buildings in New York are going to become partly residential. Uh, I think that that's what Peter was saying about infilling. Uh, cities are great when they repurpose existing land and structures for other uses. All of a sudden, New York City was completely crowded. People couldn't afford to live in it. Now there's vast uh, places for, uh, for people to live. Uh, in offices that will simply never be needed again. I don't know how to transform a building that way, uh, but I bet it can be done. Uh, and I bet some of these big office buildings can be turned into, uh, you know, uh, apartment buildings with lots of people and then the shops below uh, and the mixed use. And uh, it seems to me to be a pretty exciting opportunity, actually. Okay, we're getting lots of different questions. Um, uh, I myself am concerned that um, people may have made this move to the suburbs out of the cities and may not want to go back. And I mean on a very large scale, certainly in North America. So I wonder if either of you think that the cities, obviously they're not going to be the same, but will they survive in prominence after the virus? So, Peter, perhaps you could start with that. Well, maybe Jeffrey, you can. Or Peter, yeah. there you go. So, you know, um, the great thing about cities is either or is rarely the case. It's always both and. Um, you know, there are different kinds of urban environments. Manhattan, we seem to be referencing here, but it's a real outlier in terms of the globe. Um, people live in uh, districts and neighborhoods that are complex, mostly low rise. Uh, but they're dense enough to be walkable and have lo local destinations. That's the real alternative. The idea uh, that the world is made either of subdivisions or high rise is really the wrong uh, choice. There's all this complex stuff in between that's actually much, much better. And the more mixed it is, the better it is. So a city block that has apartments at one end and some townhouses in the middle and some uh, single family uh, scattered through it, that's the best neighborhood. It provides opportunities for everybody in one neighborhood. So one building type never fits all. That was the mistake of the suburb, and, it, and it's the rare case for the urban center. Furthermore, cities are no longer city boundaries. I mean, when you say New York, you're not talking about Manhattan. You're talking about Queens and, and Brooklyn and all the other places that offer different lifestyles. but. Uh, partake in the larger economic and cultural gestalt of the place. Um, and so that's why I don't think you should be ever, ever put that box out there, one or the other. Um, where are people going to go? To a large degree, people go where they can afford to go first. And secondly, uh, so many surveys have shown that people care a lot about the quality of the neighborhood where the parks are, how walkable the streets are, how great the shopping districts are in terms of socializing schools uh, than the actual housing form. 
Okay, we've got. Uh, Maybe uh, just to add uh, to that, and also a question. Um, people go uh, by and large uh, where their jobs are, uh, mm -hmm. and in uh, very low income settings with very uh, unproductive smallholder <laughs> agriculture, people live in uh, villages uh, or very small towns and 40, 50% of uh, the workforce is in agriculture or tied to agriculture. Uh, as agriculture becomes more productive uh, in the process of development, uh, people go to non-agricultural jobs, which have a huge advantage in more uh, densely settled areas. Services work better uh, with density, which is why cities uh, are the alternative. Instead of just moving from a farm to uh, uh, some other service-based industry in a rural area, people move to cities because those non-agricultural jobs are much more productive in an urban context. Uh, the question is whether the digital uh, opportunities change the relative productivity of different kinds of work. Uh, work that used to require intensive face-to-face -face contact, say someone who works in the insurance business or in uh, banking uh, or in media, would need to be in a city, typically. Now, uh, a lot of them are working from home. Um, accountants that used to have to uh, or work in sit find their jobs in cities now can do their work online. Of course, there's also the quality of life side. So you go where your jobs are, and there could be a gradient that because of the higher quality of life, you also choose one location relative to another, even with compensating uh, income as a result of that. So all of it means that uh, as relative costs of providing services change, uh, the advantages uh, and relative costs of living in densely settled areas versus uh, maybe smaller cities could also change. What I don't think will change, by the way, is the process of urbanization itself. Just as a highlight, the idea that the world will continue to move from today's 55% urban rate to 70% or higher by mid-century, I think is not only likely, I bet that what we count as urban will be even higher than 70% by mid-century for a basic reason. And that is that agriculture and mining are going to go basically autonomous. And so the jobs today that employ 30 or 40% of people in low-income countries are not gonna exist. Uh, these are going to be basically uh, uh, machine-based mining and machine-based agriculture. Of course, it's already happened in the rich countries where 1% of the population is in agriculture uh, in incredibly productive farms where the machines do almost all the work. And this is happening in the developing countries as well. So that means that the traditional reasons for rural life, which is uh, life in agriculture, will disappear quickly. Cities will urbanize. My question in my head is uh, which, which cities? Uh, the big cities, the medium-sized cities, uh, will we have the same rank order, uh, size structure of cities, uh, uh, Zips law, uh, that is the traditional assumption, or will that change because of the ability to work at a distance? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. There are all sorts of uh, questions coming in, but we've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, I guess the, one of the questions people would ask is the disease pandemics someone has put from the transition of the 19th to the 20th century generated several powerful urban innovations. So I guess, do you see this as an opportunity, this challenge of the COVID to fast track into the future? because of the problems that we've had to uh, negotiate? Or do you think it's going to, as, as Peter said earlier, distract us from doing the, the right thing? So could uh, Peter, could you address that quickly? 
We've really only got a few minutes. Peter? I think you're muted, Peter. Um, I don't mean to say COVID is a distraction. I think that it, it all does feather together, but what uh, Jeffrey's been talking about are more systemic changes in the, the way we work and the digitization, automation of, of mobility and of factories and of lots of productivity will have a huge impact. Um, and yet I think the shape of a healthy community will remain the same. And that is a healthy community is diverse in its population. One of the things we've le learned over and over again is the more we isolate people uh, by income or by age uh, or by family type, the more social pathology we have to confront. And so cities have to be melting pots. They have to be, and neighborhoods need to be places where people interact in ways that make it normative for people to understand and empathize with different lifestyles and different economies. Um, and so we tend to say, well, it's easy, going to be easier and easier for people to live in their remote single family dwelling. Uh, things will be delivered and they can work online. Uh, to me, that's a scary proposition. And I think it will have all sorts of not so unintended negative consequences. I can list them today. Um, furthermore, I think it's an option that's built around a mindset of wealth. This is, you know, this is a strategy for wealthy people in, w in wealthy countries. There are many countries in the world where we're just we're seeing migration from rural poverty to cities that are built around uh, industrial economies. And so mobility uh, has to, you know, and access really can't be dis decentralized in that way. So it, many conflicts ebbs and flows in many different circumstances. Um, you know, okay. I know that's an ambiguous answer, but that's the way it has to be, I think. I'm sorry to have to cut you off so abruptly. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Peter. Oh, could, I make, could I make a oh. closing comment? Well, oh, yes, one very quick comment. Go ahead. Very, very good. Uh, yeah, actually, it's two. One is, uh, I, I think uh, we will not have uh, industrial economies providing lots of jobs uh, in the future because uh, of technology. So people will be moving to services. And I don't want to be misunderstood, but I do believe that the digital is a great leapfrog for poor people. It provides e-banking, it provides uh, e-telemedicine, uh, it provides e-government services. Uh, in other words, I see it as a great way to uh, enable universal access to services and raise uh, living standards. So it's not an elitist view, believe me. It's from my, at least what I'm uh, thinking is that it is actually a great uh, leapfrogging uh, opportunity. And I'm trying to think of where the jobs will be in the future. And I think that mainly in industry, what we call goods producing sectors are the easiest to mechanize. They're the easiest to robotize. Uh, that's why we're basically in the U.S. now, we're 87 percent service employment. Uh, and uh, that's just how it's going to be across the board, because these technologies are uh, are universal. I love cities, so I'm not saying cities are going to go away because of that uh, at all. But uh, I, I just wanted to clarify that point. Finally, on COVID-19, one interesting thing to remember, many big, dense cities uh, like Hong Kong, for example, have basically been able to completely suppress transmission of the virus without losing the, the quality of daily life. Uh, Seoul, uh, of course, Beijing, Shanghai. Uh, we haven't done it in the United States because we're governed by an idiot with all due respect. Uh, no respect due. Uh, but in any event, uh, we are governed by absolutely incompetent governance. Uh, and that's the real problem of COVID-19 is uh, the incoherence of governance. That's a different topic. But anyway, I just wanted to make the point. <laughs> well, thank you, um, Jeffrey Sachs and Peter Calthorpe. Uh, actually segues very well to the digital aspects about the pandemic with our next speaker, who's going to be addressing big data analytics in a post-pandemic world. So thank you both. Um, we are now going to move on to the next segment of the program, uh, post-pandemic perspective.
I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Cameron Khan. Dr. Khan is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Public Health at the University of Toronto. He's a practicing physician, an infectious disease expert. He's also the founder and CEO of Blue Dot Inc., which uses artificial intelligence to predict the behavior of pandemics by developing predictive algorithms. Blue Dot accurately predicted the spread of the coronavirus before it was categorized as a pandemic. So, Dr. Khan, I'd like you to take it away, and you're going to be discussing the role of big data analytics in a post-pandemic world. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Mary, and, and good afternoon uh, now from, from Toronto uh, in Canada here. Um, I'm going to just share my, I've got some slides. Let me see if I can share those and see if you are able to see those. Um, I'm just going to have to hit play here. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation today. I'll, I'll be speaking about the role of data and analytics and how we can be using uh, these tools to build greater resilience to the growing number of epidemic threats that we are, are facing in our world today. I'm going to just start out here with this image. Speaking of data, this is a map of the world that is just based on the world's commercial air travel data. Um, what you can see here, uh, as, as you can perhaps uh, appreciate from this image, this is a world map. And this is looking at how the world's cities are interconnected through commercial air travel. And I think it reveals a number of things, uh, you know, not only some of the physical geography of the world, but also some of the social fabric of how the global community is is interconnected and i think there are also some important insights about the economic geography you can see certainly some areas of the world that are far more industrialized um, but also other parts of the of the globe that are uh, less developed and perhaps more vulnerable uh, as we look forward to um, to global epidemics and pandemics um, what i do think this highlights and really reveals is perhaps most importantly, just how interconnected our world is. Uh, and of course, with that interconnectedness uh, comes interdependence as well. So what I'd like to do is take a moment and just reflect a little bit on, you know, where we have come from in the past few decades. I think we can all agree that this has been an incredibly painful uh, pandemic. Um, and that we want to get out of it as soon as we can and as safely as we can. But I'm, I'm sure we can all agree that we do not want to be back in the next pandemic anytime soon. So I'm going to just take us through for a moment. So this actually, I think, picks up on one of the comments earlier that, you know, the pandemic will end. And, and absolutely, I would agree, you know, this, this will pass. Um, but I think it's important to just ask ourselves, where have we come from in the last few decades? So clearly we are here in the worst pandemic in 100 years uh, with COVID-19, but it wasn't that long ago, uh, you may remember in 2016, that another virus, Zika virus, uh, was spreading across Latin America and was causing these pretty profound birth defects in newborns, causing microcephaly and other types of birth defects. It was a year before that. This image used to uh, be fairly jarring when people looked at it, a, a wedding with people wearing masks. Today, it, it seems perhaps a little less jarring as we're going through COVID-19, but this is in Seoul in South Korea. And this was an outbreak of MERS or the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, another novel coronavirus that um, caused a, a deadly outbreak back in 2015. And the year before that, you'll recall that we had the largest outbreak of Ebola virus in history in West Africa, which, uh, you know, cost us thousands of lives and also um, spread to other countries uh, across the globe. The year before that, there was an outbreak of a, a virus called chikungunya, which quickly spread, started in the Caribbean and uh, uh, rapidly spread across Latin America through this mosquito here, a uh, type of 80s mosquito. Um, it was only about 10 years ago that we actually were in another pandemic, and perhaps maybe we've, we've forgotten that, but the H1N1 influenza pandemic 
um, which was thankfully not as severe of, as perhaps the Spanish flu or, or what we're going through today with COVID-19, but a pandemic nonetheless that spread around the world at, at unprecedented speed. And my career as an infectious disease physician began six years before that in 2003. Um, this experience has been a bit of deja vu for me, as you can imagine, um, back in 2003, a novel coronavirus emerged in Guangdong province, uh, spread around the world, showed up in hospitals, infected healthcare workers, led to the deaths of people in our city, uh, had massive economic and social impacts. Um, that was with SARS-CoV, and then here we are with SARS-CoV-2. Um, the first outbreak, of course, crippled cities uh, across the planet. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 has pretty much crippled the entire planet. Um, so I think some of the questions here are, what can we learn from these various events? And I think one of the, the perhaps the most obvious learnings and lessons from these experiences is that in our hyper-connected world, outbreaks spread incredibly quickly. And that if we want to stay a step ahead of them, that means that we will have to come up with ways of moving even faster. Um, thankfully, we are in an interesting era where we have growing access to data. We have a lot of the raw materials to do that. Growing access to big data, advanced analytical tools like machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, and other types of digital and information technologies, the internet, that can allow us to disseminate and spread uh, insights around the world faster than the outbreaks themselves can spread. But of course, bringing all those materials and pieces together is uh, you know a very um, uh, it's a not a small undertaking. This is something that um, I have been involved in in my role as an academic for the last eighteen years since the SARS outbreak, and the last seven years um, founding Blue Dot, uh, which uh, Mary, as you mentioned, is a is a digital health company um, that I founded largely to try and translate some of the scientific research and discoveries uh, I was doing as an academic into digital solutions that allow us to move faster uh, and try and get in front of these types of threats. For the last seven years, our eclectic team of, uh, of doctors and veterinarians and epidemiologists and geographers and data scientists, engineers, uh, we've all been working together to build what we refer to as an early warning system for epidemics. There are three main pillars, and I'll just walk you briefly through how technology and data and analytics are allowing us to, uh, to, to move uh, much more quickly than we, we were able to in the past. The first pillar is really on detection of outbreaks and threats uh, and uh, to, to, to be able to generate much more of a global panoramic view of what is happening uh, in the world. Second, to be able to assess uh, these threats in terms of their ability to, dis to, to spread. And we know that uh, outbreaks can spread across borders and across continents in hours or days, um, as well as to assess what the impacts and consequences may be of a case that has shown up in another geographic area in the world. And finally, those insights have to be translated into something that's actionable. Uh, and so that is another key pillar that we've been doing a lot of work on uh, so that we can not only disseminate some of these insights to the public sector with government, but also the private sector the healthcare uh, sector as well. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in, in just a moment. Um, really briefly on this first pillar, um, artificial intelligence can help us augment our abilities to detect epidemic threats and, and do this in a timely manner. Uh, what we've been working on at Blue Dot is um, generating, um, having our engineers curate information that is being officially reported through public health agencies across the globe and automatically extracting and synthesizing all of those notifiable diseases. But we're complementing that information with unofficial reports, things that may be reported in a local um, news, uh, you know, uh, local media online uh, or in a health forum or healthcare blog. Um, we've been using uh, natural language processing and machine learning to curate data on over 150 different diseases and syndromes, gathering this intelligence in 65 different languages and doing this every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day. Now, that would require a pretty large team of subject matter experts to go through all of that, but this is where machine learning and AI can really augment our capabilities. So to distinguish that, you know, a particular article 
maybe about the heavy metal band anthrax or another article maybe about a real outbreak of anthrax. Um, these types of analytical tools can allow us to extract key pieces of information to eliminate noise, to extract information about the pathogen or the syndrome, the location, the time, contextual factors such as case counts, deaths, et cetera. And so ultimately it is these um, analytical tools that can allow us to take vast amounts of unstructured text data and to process it, organize it, structure it by place, time, and uh, the name of the pathogen. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, diseases spread incredibly quickly. And this image, of course, uh, is perhaps a little bit um, uh, less uh, consistent or compatible with the way that air travel is moving uh, in 2020. But certainly in years gone by, um, the world is increasingly mobile. In 2019, there were over 4 billion passengers that boarded flights and traveled around the world, almost 7 trillion kilometers traveled uh, on commercial flights worldwide. Um, and so this is the conduit for how diseases can spread. The platforms that we've been building are the AI that is gathering and processing all of this intelligence through unofficial and uh, official sources online is talking to the system that is analyzing the entire world's commercial air travel data, all of the flight schedules across the planet, the passenger level anonymized flight itineraries, uh, so you can see from this image here, which was generated in just about a second or two uh, on the morning of December 31st, when our platform picked up an unusual cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan uh, in China, uh, this is revealing some of those nonstop flights. You can see some of them into places like New York City and San Francisco. And then the circles are the final destinations of those travelers. The, um, analytics here, we published the first peer reviewed um, publication or scientific study on COVID-19. Again, this was before it had its name, uh, really just at the, uh, even actually prior to it, it being recognized as a coronavirus and highlighting a number of these key cities, places like Bangkok and Tokyo were at the top of, of that list. And it turned out that Bangkok and Tokyo, for example, were the, the number one and number two cities that actually received cases of COVID-19 after it uh, appeared outside of mainland China. So we've been using these kinds of arcs to be able to identify the places downstream that may be thousands of kilometers away, but which need to be aware of and notified of potential risks uh, from an epidemic that they may be completely unaware of. Now, as a frontline healthcare worker and a practicing infectious disease physician, you know, I've really seen and, and I'm trained as a public health physician, I've really seen a bit of a disconnect between a panoramic view that our public health community has, which is to really understand what's happening in the population <clears throat> versus the frontline healthcare worker who has a much more myopic view of the world. So when an outbreak occurs, generally speaking, it's the public health sector that may hear about this first. Um, and then there's a bit of a trickle over effect where healthcare workers, hospitals, et cetera, are learning about it uh, thereafter. Uh, that can be a real challenge and a risk because sick patients don't show up in the public health department. They show up in the emergency department. And for many clinicians, um, you know, we maybe have never been trained to uh, manage these diseases or may not have even potentially heard of these diseases uh, ever before. So really critical that um, these insights are reaching these audiences in a timely manner. And then, of course, the private sector and the general public are often then lagging further behind and learning about these um, these particular events later in the process. We've always envisioned and imagined, and we have certainly the technical capabilities to be doing this in a more contemporaneous way. Uh, a lot of our work at Blue Dot has been working with government agencies across multiple different branches of government, public health, uh, national defense, national security, agriculture, and really trying to um, generate this type of epidemic intelligence so that we can make timely decisions. Uh, because as we've learned with COVID-19, you know, time is our most valuable resource. It gives us an opportunity to mitigate the impacts from an outbreak. I've spoken about the ability and the, the necessity of getting this into the frontline uh, healthcare community. And so we've been working with hospitals and emergency departments to make sure that the triage, every time a patient comes into a hospital, can, can make use of this type of intelligence, as well as giving healthcare workers a bit of a heads up that um, they should be thinking about um, a particular disease. You can imagine during you know, early January when 
most clinicians would be thinking about influenza, it would be worthwhile knowing that there is perhaps another outbreak occurring uh, involving a respiratory illness that may look like influenza. Um, and also, we've been working with um, private sector organizations like airlines and commercial airports so that they can not only protect their employees, but also uh, make sure they're protecting passengers and, and their, their key stakeholders. So this is an important ecosystem that I think will be uh, very important for us to build out uh, as we look beyond this pandemic. Now, what I'd like to do in just the last moment or two here is just say that um, data and analytics and technology can really allow us to become, uh, you know, better firefighters, if you will. We can, you know, pick up the, the smoke at an earlier stage, mobilize a timely response and, and mitigate some of the consequences. But it, I think it's also important for us, especially as we're talking about um, settlements across the world and population growth and urbanization is to be thinking about what are the underlying drivers of where are these, you know, various uh, novel uh, viruses and pathogens and outbreaks, where are they coming from? And I think one of the important lessons for us is that the vast majority of these outbreaks that we are seeing are coming from viruses that were initially found in animal populations, uh, in some instances in livestock, like influenza viruses, uh, and in other instances from wild animals like coronaviruses. Um, so it's going to be very important for us as we look past this pandemic to not just focus on better firefighting and using data and analytics and technology to move smarter and faster, but ultimately to be asking ourselves, are there ways that we can design our cities and think about how we are interacting with the rest of our planet uh, so that we're minimizing the sparks that could ignite the next dangerous outbreak or pandemic. And I think this is a really, really important point um, because our health and our security and our prosperity are really intertwined with the health of other living systems uh, across our globe. Um, so I, I'd like to perhaps end there and, and just leave that thought uh, for us uh, perhaps during the, uh, the Q&A session. Let me see if I can stop sharing my screen here. Okay, there we go. Uh, you might be on mute. Mary, I think you're on mute. Not anymore. Uh, okay, so thank you, Dr. Khan, for that um, stimulating presentation. I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Ms. Karen Harris. She's the Managing Director of the Macro Trend Group at Bain & Company. Her group analyzes global macroeconomics, social trends, and geopolitics to identify global trends, which portend shifting growth patterns. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the National Committee on US-China Relations, and the Economic Club of New York. She's going to speak about the post-pandemic impact on global economies. Welcome, Ms. Harris. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having me as a speaker today. It's a, it's a real honor. I'm going to circle back to the topic we were covering before uh, Dr. Khan's fascinating address, back to technologies at a broader level, because what I found fascinating about, uh, about listening to our keynotes and about this broader discussion is we talk about the impact of technologies on cities, but not the city itself as a technology. And the city that we see today, which, which was alluded to by, by the keynote speakers, is a technological solution to the challenge of the Industrial Revolution that we needed to cluster labor and materials together for the purposes of production. And yet the world has changed markedly since then. It feels like it's changed markedly since the weekend these days, but, but from an economic development point of view, the path forward, the industries, as, as a Professor Sachs mentioned, the digitalization of many economies, the move of advanced economies towards the service sector rather than the industrial sector, being the sources of employment, the development of countries like China, all of those have shifted 
And the technologies that supported this city have also changed. And in particular, the one I'd like to highlight is the cost of distance, uh, the cost of moving goods, the cost of moving people, uh, and the cost of moving information, which has collapsed in many cases. And this isn't simply the cost. And by the cost of moving people, it's not, I'm not talking about Hyperloop, but rather that we now move information instead of people, the, uh, the, the movement of so much information to digital and advanced logistics, particularly in advanced economies. And as a result, the urbanization rates have actually been declining in many cities in advanced economies. To be clear, that does not mean that cities have been shrinking, but rather that growth rates have been slowing. So as an example, if we look at the United States in the early part of this century, had urbanization continued at a straight line, we would have seen 13 million more people living in cities. Instead, we saw an incremental six to seven million people living in cities, which means about 2% of the population move to either suburbs or exurbs, which are walkable areas outside of cities. This was prior to the pandemic, but like so many trends has been accelerated by the pandemic. And I wanna focus on that technology because of the technology of the city and how it's changing and what we call exurbanization, or the a result of the declining cost of distance, even though some of the most acute challenges today for urban environments exist in emerging markets, this disruptive technology in advanced economies is going to have ripple effect ripple effects on the development prospects of emerging markets. So, uh, so I will. So let me start with that impact on advanced economies. And I think the good news that we see is that the technologies to alleviate pressure on some of the urban environments that uh, that Peter was talking about, the sprawl uh, that we saw coming, the lack of affordability in tier one cities is, is emerging in a ways that can allow the middle class to live, work and play in less less economically challenging places, again, in advanced economies, uh, that we can telecommute, that we can, uh, that we can work remotely, work in hybrid means that will reduce the costs of, uh, of commuting, but also that we can access goods and services that are threshold for people to feel comfortable living places. Education and healthcare are two of the most important ones. We've seen real innovations in the ability to disperse those out to more remote areas. And of course, access to goods and services through improving logistics. This makes location less important and more important at the same time. It's less important for all of the old uh, boring reasons to anchor neighborhoods within a, com a commutable range of jobs, which, as we've seen again in this terrible test pressure cooker of the pandemic, how quickly that can change. If we wanted to test as as scientists or social scientists the impact of uh, of working remotely, I don't think anyone would suggest an experiment where we shut everything down and sent everyone home. Uh, and yet that is what we've seen in so many markets. We've seen that impact with real costs, cost to mental health, cost to some efficiency, but but a, a greater implementability than I think many would have uh, would have thought prior to this. Um, so the, that that tyranny of distance needing to be close to employment is being relieved. And yet and the and yet we are seeing people be able to choose locations based on amenities and other uh, and other features. So that has created both a movement towards more attractable, uh, more attractive, walkable urban cores. And this gets to what the what again, what the keynote speakers were noting that calling the death of cities feels a little premature, that there are features uh, social, cult social and cultural features that uh, that are still compelling in these cities that will emerge uh, after the pandemic. And these cities, as a result, have become, frankly, the places where 
affluent people or and or young single people live increasingly as families find themselves pushed out based on affordability. And that that brings to mind the second movement. That's the exact opposite. The outward migration to beyond the further furthest metropolitan edges to the exurbs that sit outside commuter belts. Technologies are enabling that, and that is the uh, that is the end of the technology of the industrial revolution in advanced economies. An acknowledgement of what the World Economic Forum calls the fourth industrial revolution that we are living and working in ways that don't require that's the sort of density of materials and labor that we saw in the prior industrial revolution. So from it, for middle income families in advanced economies, this is largely uh, good news. Of course, we've seen price spikes because of COVID that, uh, that will disrupt that, that create more affluence in those areas. But over time, that alleviates some of the pressure of needing to be in an urban environment. Uh, in China, we've actually seen how some of these technologies, e-commerce delivery, uh, e-commerce and delivery have revolutionized lifestyles in rural and inland provinces away from some of the more sprawling and dense coastal cities that we saw in the, in the prior presentations. For emerging markets, like places like India, the use of technologies may be crucial to help alleviate the movement of people to overcrowded, under-infrastructured cities by providing economic opportunities outside of those, those cities, with, of course, connectivity being a real barrier. But the descaling of manufacturing, of production, uh, and advanced logistics may create opportunities that can, in a, in a most in a um, optimistic world, can uh, can create greater opportunities outside of cities and alleviate some of the challenges that that other speakers today have already alluded to. Now, of course, much of what what drives this new spatial economics, this new development pattern, is automation. And that will create a, a great deal of job displacement. Uh, Jeff Sachs mentioned that in his in his final remarks. Um, and, and there will be a temptation on the part of some countries and communities to regulate that out. If COVID has taught us nothing, as we just saw from Dr. Khan's presentation, it has shown us how porous borders are. And while that can feel like a temporarily good solution, we've seen time and time again that the challenges of uh, that keeping out a technology as a way of slowing, uh, slowing its uptake is a, a temporary solution at best. I, what concerns me the most about this development pattern and the bad news is that these technologies that enable reshoring of manufacturing to advanced economies because labor is less necessary, that enable people to disperse and live in uh, walkable cities and walkable high streets outside of urban environments that uh, de-densify some of the urban environments and, and alleviate some of the many problems we've heard about today, those same technologies and the most effective means of development that the world has seen over the past decades, which is export-led growth. When you think about what the, the essence of export-led growth is, it is allowing economies to export it initially its labor uh, competitively to draw business, to draw industries to which countries and therefore leg up the development curve. We saw this uh, effectively done in Japan and its post-war recoveries, the Asian tigers, and the largest and most, uh, most impressive example is China moving hundreds of millions of people out of poverty into, uh, into a consuming class through the use of this technique. Now, if we think that the, auto, the same automation that ends the need to cluster people because we replace labor uh, with it uh, means that we can move uh, over to advanced economies, uh, move production to advanced economies, it also cuts off that means of production, uh, means of development. And so today, I would say the challenge I would put to uh, the UN, those of us on this call, is what do we need to think ahead in terms of new development strategies, job retraining, safety nets, 
which will of course vary by country based on values and resources as the technology of urbanization advances and as automation shifts the way uh, jobs, uh, jobs operate around the world. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, we are now coming to our final speaker. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you do. can hear me. Um, Mr. Sam Lubell. Um, Sam Lubell is a respected voice in the field of architecture and planning. He's author of eight books, a former editor of the Architect newspaper. Lubell has written for the New York Times, LA Times, and Architectural Review, amongst other publications. He has curated exhibits throughout the country and has special skills in making design concerns relevant to the general public. So we welcome you, Mr. LaBelle. Thank you uh, very much. It's been a really uh, very interesting uh, discussion so far, and I'm very excited to be part of it. Uh, I just wanna make sure you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great, great. Um, and I think um, I, I really wanna pick up on a lot of these uh, points about, um, I really like the point uh, that the last speaker was making about how these incredible changes in technology um, and these incredible changes uh, in just the way our society works, we have to be very mindful of how that affects people. So if we go to automation, having the safety net and have, being able to retrain people and kind of be empathetic to people is, is a huge part of uh, adapting to these, these changes that I think you know sometimes gets lost in the shuffle. Um, but I'm gonna share my screen. Um, if, uh, let's see. Speaking of technologies, here we go. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Oh, okay, great. So um, what I'm uh, talking about uh, sort of dovetails with, with some of the discussions we've already been having, but what I focus on is uh, cities and architecture as a, as a journalist and critic. And uh, what I've noticed is um, obviously COVID, uh, which we've all been, goes without saying, has been a horrific experience for the world um, uh, without a doubt, uh, but there are some, uh, as we say, silver linings. Uh, I hate to say that, but, but it, it's true. And one of them is uh, the idea of kind of spurring us to rethink about our cities and spurring us to rethink about our architecture. And uh, I like to say that uh, cities and buildings, uh, kind of like us, like people, are prone to inertia. We don't like to change. <laughs> um, and um, and that's certainly, you know, that's always been the case uh, with cities and with buildings and with people. <laughs> and one thing uh, more than almost anything that can shake us out of that inertia is a disaster. And pandemics are, you know, obviously one of the biggest disasters the world can experience. Um, so uh, pandemics have always changed how we think about our cities and how we think about our buildings. Um, so uh, th these are some images that kind of uh, kind of reveal that to some extent. The first uh, on the top left there is uh, the Lazarettos, the, uh, the first quarantines back in the uh, medieval times um, uh, in Italy. Um, and just the creation of, you know, this, this whole concept of quarantining people having to be part of a city. Um, and the idea that, you know, sort of starting to realize after the, the Black Death uh, uh, in Europe and in the medieval times that we can't just cluster people into really incredibly tight spaces even if they weren't sure why they knew it was better to, to, to change that. And you can see on the top right, Renaissance cities started to open up with uh, large piazzas and open spaces. Um, and obviously that was part of uh, other cultural trends, but it certainly had to do with health as well. And then you see going down the line here in Paris, the, you know, the, the boulevards of Haussmann, there are so many other reasons, but one of the reasons was, was public health and opening up spaces below that. The sewers that were built for Haussmann doing the same thing. Uh, and then in the bottom images there, the, the age of modernism, uh, uh, you know, urban renewal, uh, taking out slums, which in a lot of cases had an incredibly damaging uh, side effects. But one of the main drivers of that was uh, public health and opening up spaces. Modernism of self, the buildings of glass and steel being more uh, more germ-free and, and germ being able, able to clean them. And then sanitoriums, uh, see on the right, one by Alvar Aalto. The idea of uh, opening up space and air, kind of changing architecture in a lot of ways in the future, just that idea of doing that. So it's 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 something that's always driven change, and it's certainly the case this time around. 
Uh, at first, we we saw it in the very beginning. This this most of these images come from the first month or two of the pandemic, uh, and we were able to uh, really quickly respond to the issues of health uh, through changes in architecture or through elements of architecture that were uh, kind of on the fringes. There's you know and and sort of not as mainstream, but are already being driven to the mainstream because of uh, what's going on with COVID. So you, that that counts with sort of. Uh, prefabricated construction, uh, the third circle there on the right there, you have a hospital, two hospitals in Wuhan that were built in really a matter of weeks, uh, thanks to prefabrication. Um, and um, that is sort of just, you know, an astonishing uh, speed and really opened up people's minds to the, to the ability of doing that. And prefabrication is something that is taking off. I'm just writing a story now for Echo Digest about how prefabrication, people want to build things faster and, and they want to do things a little bit cheaper. And people are finally kind of opening up to something that's always been a dream of architects and designers, but it's sort of becoming a little bit more mainstream. Other things are building in fabric designs, uh, building, uh, uh, building, and you can see on the bottom right, uh, reusing existing buildings a little bit more efficiently. That's the Javits Center in New York that was reused as a hospital. So just uh, uh, many, and, and on the top right, uh, fabric structure is being used for drive through testing. Um, and, and, and so these are all sort of things that were on the fringes that have become mainstream. Um, Sam, excuse me, interrupting. Um, I think you're showing us this in presenter mode, these uh, slides. Oh, I see. If you okay. could just thank sure, you. Sure, of course. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. How can I? Uh... Is that better? Yes. Okay, great, great. Uh, again, the technical issues that we're all facing. <laughs> Sorry about that. I got to, you got to see the behind the scenes in my presentation. Uh, but anyway, uh, so now we're seeing how it's changing cities moving forward. Um, we saw the early stages, but as, as the pandemic uh, moved on, um, we, people have been talking about the top left image, which is how we're moving a little bit more away from uh, mega cities, uh, which is something that was already happening. It was already on the fringes because uh, cities like New York, London, Paris, LA were just becoming too expensive. People were moving to suburbs, they were moving to smaller cities, but that's really picked up during the pandemic. And as people have pointed out, that's not going to replace cities or large cities by any means, but it'll take off some of the pressure of them. So it's not something we have to look at as necessarily a negative thing. Uh, the image of suburbs that I use there is not the best, but you can do that. You can do it more responsibly. Um, and also the idea that cities, uh, streets, the bottom left being used as public spaces, um, that's something that's the open streets program in New York has opened up, you know, hundreds of miles of streets as public spaces, uh, opening up streets for restaurants, which you see in the center, um, changing parks. Uh, you can see this is the Domino Park in, in Brooklyn on the left. Uh, there are social distance circles that were made, but the idea that parks have picked up a lot of the slack, they've become, you know, even more essential during the pandemic when so many other things, like the outlets are, are gone and we're realizing the importance of parks. Um, and then obviously what we're on now, the, the, the right, the image on the right there shows, um, you know, something we've been talking about uh, and, you know, we're, we're participating in, which is the idea that uh, we're telecommuting and people are doing uh, less driving even now, uh, although it's certainly picked up and doing more telecommuting and that's you know fundamentally shifting our cities in ways that we're still coming to terms with and I think we'll still be coming to terms with even a decade from now so things are just changing so so rapidly but it's also changing um, how we're living um, on the left you can see we're all you know we're working from home we're uh, we're working out from home uh, we're we're uh, you know we're finding new ways to organize our space if we have open spaces we're breaking them up into little smaller spaces so we can have a little bit of privacy from our kids and from uh, other people. Um, and we're also really uh, interested in things uh, that we were kind of taking for granted before, like natural light and like natural ventilation, things that, you know, if you're stuck at home in quarantine, you're starting to starting to realize that it's quite important <laughs> and it's also good for health. Um, and the same thing for semi-public spaces like balconies and other spaces that people can have in their houses or near their houses. Um, and then everywhere else, everything is changing. And I don't think, I think if you, you know, we sort of are taking for granted these things, but these are seismic shifts in the way we're living. Um, so schools, you don't have like sort of the rows of desks on the top left, you see there's so many different ways of arranging uh, the way we're working. And there's some of these hybrid models and there's other models and it's just kind of these shifts. 
and offices, these two images on the right, you know, we, we've seen it slowly as people start to go back to offices, but, um, and, and I know several people who are, but I'm not personally going back to an office yet, but people are not working close to each other the way they did. Uh, the open office in many ways that people were coveting for so long is being rethought completely. Uh, and and uh, movement patterns are being rethought. And then on the bottom left, everything is being rethought. So theaters, you know, we're, we're going instead of movies, we're going to drive-ins again. Um, and uh, at home, we're kind of rethinking what is leisure and what is work. Um, and that's these are things that are just the beginning of the changes um, uh, that are going on. So I mentioned that you know we're interested in semi-outdoor space, but on the left, there are models like uh, this model by Moshe Safdie. Uh, it's a new version of his habitat. This is something that's being built in Ecuador. Um, the outdoor space being built on a large scale and uh, being built, uh, greenery and buildings being built on the scale of mega buildings and, and density and build, bringing, uh, you know, these kind of uh, elements that we all are craving into urban, into the urban realm on a mass basis. Uh, and the dining that I mentioned uh, on the top left, we have to think about how we're going to do that for the winter. Um, and then something that people have been talking about briefly, which is um, shifting this change of uh, of, of uh, retail and offices, if we're not going to be using them, um, in the center, it's sort of a cheeky image, but the idea that offices will become uh, living spaces is certainly going to happen. And it's already, it's happened in a lot of the world. Um, a lot of urban areas, uh, offices from the 30s and 40s have been already shifted into uh, residential. Uh, that's going to happen on a much, uh, much more extreme basis and it can help solve some of the housing issues. But on the top right, uh, that's a mall that's been shifted into housing and then retail is being shifted into housing as well. Um, and then on the bottom right, the idea of our workspaces is, is going to be hybridized with our living spaces. And again, as we see now, our living spaces are being hybridized with our working spaces. So these are monumental shifts that were sort of on the edges and sort of um, kind of uh, innovations that were sort of coming for other reasons. And now they're, now they're coming full steam ahead. Um, but what's really, really important to note is that Yes, we need to rethink our spaces because of the pandemic, and we need to rethink our spaces for future, unfortunately, pandemic that could come. Um, but pandemics and COVID are not what we, the only things that we need to start rethinking. Um, we can't just think like we did with COVID. Oh, this is happening. Let's respond. We need to think ahead of time. And that's an, just a key. A key thing is that we need to think ahead of the curve. We need to think of what's coming next and what are the urban challenges that we can start dealing with now and start having, you know, start having solutions for. So that's flooding, gentrification, uh, terrorism, global warming, sprawl, uh, all things that, a couple of things that are even mentioned, but these are all things that, how are we going to think ahead? How are we not going to be caught after the fact and start having to think of ideas for? Um, and that goes for, uh, you know, inequity in urban planning. It goes for traffic. It goes for housing costs. It goes for homelessness. There's just so many things that if we wait till uh, these get out of control, which in some cases they honestly are uh, already, but, they, but not to the level that people are, you know, calling for in the way they did changes with COVID, uh, it's going to be too late. So we have to do these early. And there are so many ideas. The future really is now. And if we don't start thinking about these things now, it, it's just too late, just like with COVID. Uh, by the time we were dealing with it, it was too late. Um, so some of these interesting ideas, I'm sure some of you are familiar with. I'll just run through them quickly, then I'll be done with my presentation. Urban farming on the top left, uh, bicycle highways on the top, the, the bottom. Uh, excuse me, on the left, far left. Uh, instead of building highways, building uh, bicycle highways is something that's an incredibly, uh, I think, an intelligent idea. Uh, instead of building parks for the sake of parks, on the bottom left, this is a plan for New York to build parks that are actually going to serve. For flooding and, and rising tides uh, instead of building walls. I think it's a genius uh, idea that's spreading around the world. Uh, using prefabrication on the top for mo uh, a modular construction for homelessness and dealing with that. On the bottom, using uh, infrastructure, this is actually sewage pipes being built to, to build new housing, um, uh, which I think is really a smart idea that's being experimented with in, in all over the world. This here it's in Tokyo. New, new uh, transit solutions like the Hyperloop on the top right, uh, not necessarily advocating this is the only one, but uh, we're, we're basically in transit. We're, we're stuck in a, in a mode that was developed more than a century ago, actually basically a century and a half ago. Uh, we, we need to be thinking about new modes of transit. Um, and that's really, you know, that's really just the beginning. Um, then, you know, 
We want to cap our freeways on the top left. We want to build bridges that are also parks and also uh, retail uh, spaces and, and, and public spaces. We want to, you know, think about on the top right, turning, uh, you know, sewer drains like the LA River basically into urban parks. Um, and and there's just so many more. I'm not going to go through everything, but um, but we really need to be thinking ahead. We can't be thinking from behind, and we can't let inertia. Uh, let us think about the cities the way we always have. Um, so that's my, uh, that's my plea. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties, but I think that's part for the course. And uh, thanks, thanks again. It's been a fascinating discussion. Well, thank you um, very much, uh, Sam LaBelle. Um, uh, all three speakers have raised some very uh, interesting and diverse questions. Um, very hard to cover them all. Um, I think one of the chief things that's of concern is we now have a very different view to space, personal space, public space. Um, it, with regard to the future, in high density population areas, space is at a premium. So how do you combine the discipline as a planner and an architect with the constraints of disease? And how can you predict things like a pandemic? How can you allow for this in your planning? So um, I don't know if um, you want to take that, Dr. Khan or Sam, you want to, maybe Sam, you could start with that. Uh, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start, but I'd love to hear what everybody uh, has to say. I, I, I must say, uh, I, I, if you talk to any uh, architect or really any designer, one thing they actually like, which is sort of, uh, you wouldn't expect, but the one thing every designer actually likes is constraints, because uh, it really drives Creativity. If there's no constraints, it's just okay. What do I do now? What, what do I work with? So, constraints can be really uh, helpful, and they can kind of focus uh, designs. And, and, and you've seen some of the things that I uh, propose. Those are all based on constraints and creative solutions. And that's one thing that designers do really well is think of creative solutions uh, in, re in re with respect to constraints. And they've been doing that very much with the pandemic. And, and I've been, you know. Devastated by the pandemic, but but been encouraged by some of the creative solutions to restaurants, uh, to to medical issues, to offices, to everything, to houses, to everything that we do. And I think that instead of looking at things like, oh no, we have this constraint, we can think of no, it, we have these creative people that really are trained to to work with these constraints and think of creative ways to to deal with them. Okay, perhaps uh, Dr. Khan, if you're still with us, you could address that. About how, sure. how you can convert some T info. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, let me just start out by saying pandemics and epidemics. I hope I left you with the impression not to, to frighten anyone, but we're already in a cycle. We, we are experiencing these. There have been six global public health emergencies declared in the last 10 years. So, that's one every 20 months, just to kind of do the math there. So, you know, this, this problem isn't going away. Now, I'm not uh, an architect or an expert in land use, but what I will say is um, I think a few things that I had heard, I, I live in, in downtown Toronto and the community I'm in is extremely mixed use. So I can shop, work, play, kind of do everything in a fairly small area. And I also almost never drive. I ride my bike pretty much everywhere. So I think in some ways when we're thinking about the, the movement of diseases, it is ultimately humans that are transporting diseases and moving them from one place to another. So I think having mixed use environments prevents or at least mitigates against the need to compartmentalize your life and move from your residential neighborhood to the work neighborhood, to the shopping neighborhood, to the recreation neighborhood. So I think that is um, is one important um, way to, to, to be designing cities. But I think going to Sam's point, I think there are lots of opportunities for creativity as it, as it relates to humans need for social interaction. We're social creatures and we require that interaction. How can we create spaces that allow for those interactions, but at the same time, uh, mitigate against the risks of lots of crowding that could that could propagate um, the uh, the dispersion of diseases. And I think there are already several examples that, that Sam showed uh, historically of how land use policies have been influenced by, by epidemics. So I think as the world's population increases and we are living more in urban environments, I think this is where it's gonna have to unleash our creativity around how do we, how do we use our space in the most efficient way possible um, 
for for the social interaction we desire, but also make sh making sure that we're uh, you know preserving our mental health and of course our health as it relates to uh, infectious diseases. So just a few thoughts. Okay, perhaps Karen can take this next question. Thinking ahead to planning from an economic standpoint, banks aren't particularly renowned for being creative shakers. Um, and you're having to think and forecast global trends. Do you think banks, I know in England, uh, they've started to disassociate from the oil industry and put more money into alternative technologies and such. Do you think this will accelerate that movement? And is that your kind of forecast globally for where money's going to go in the future for, for future planning? If it's going to go into more healthy alternative living? Yeah, I think one of the more positive trends we've seen through the pandemic is a really invigorated focus on uh, on environmental, social and governance, ESG metrics uh, for investors. Some of that thinking has frankly been led by uh, executives at Bank of America before we write off, uh, write off banks completely. But generally, we've seen uh, that investors themselves, pension funds who are the final, the end owners of many of the assets on behalf of retirees and, and wealth funds around the country, particularly uh, we see great examples from, from uh, Dr. Khan's home market of Canada, focusing on these goals. Will this happen overnight? No. I mean, there's lots of legitimate criticisms that, that funds that say they have ESG uh, have oil companies in them, oil majors in them. But I do think that we've seen where environmental effect, environmental was already gaining traction as as a metric that now uh, with some of the social movements that we've seen uh, attraction there as well. So I am hopeful and I wouldn't write off private capital either. Uh, many that pension funds investing directly, some of uh, alternative forms of capital who have some accountability also are thinking uh, thinking more towards those goals. Well, I hate to uh, wind things up so quickly because we have hundreds, if not hundreds of questions on here in the chat room. Um, most people saying thank you for such wonderful, stimulating, diverse discussion. But the, the, the range of questions is remarkable. If you're coming from, a, you know, um, an underdeveloped country, your concern is sewage and water and how you keep people in close proximity healthy. So that's a very different concern from someone being in um, a big a big city. But um, I think you've all contributed enormously today. Um, we've got great distinguished speakers from around the world taking part. Um, this was very engaging and thought provoking, thought provoking for all of us. And we, I'm so sorry, we just couldn't cover all the great questions in the chat box. So we hope you can continue the discussions, however, online, as I see they're going on, uh, during Urban October and beyond. The event today was brought to you by the UN Habitat in partnership with the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization, the American Institute of Architects. Did everyone catch that? Is my sound still good? It was a bit garbled. Thank you, Mary. Go ahead. Yeah, we can hear you. So um, I was just going to make an attempt to close the meeting um, and thank everybody concerned. I'm going to repeat it in case you couldn't hear that. Um, all the engaging and thought provoking discussions. I hope you continue them in the chat box and also during urban October, continue these discussions. And the event today was brought to you by the UN Habitat in partnership with the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization and the American Institute of Architects. Um, I'd like to wish you all a very happy World Habitat Day and uh, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>